thank you all so much for coming to this workshop this afternoon. Um, as you'll be well aware, um, this is around inclusive design in audio products. Um, so just a little outline on, on what we've got coming up today. So what's in store for this workshop? Um, so we're going to do a little kind of round robin show and tell from all of our amazing panelists here who will introduce themselves in a sec. Um, we're also going to have a few updates from around the audio industry around all the great work that's happening towards accessibility and inclusive design. Harry is going to then do a little headline set um, focusing on juice and inclusive design using juice. Um, and then we're going to take a little break. And after that, we're going to do roundtable discussion for all of your questions, Q&A. Little kind of um, question from me to begin that around what we can all do to work together to improve inclusion across the industry. But beyond that, we'll open up to whatever questions anyone has, whether that's online or in the room. Um, so yeah, just to crack on, firstly, who am I? Why am I doing this? Um, I'm a bit of an imposter, really. I'm not an audio developer. Um, just wanted to put my hands up and say that. Um, I am a user of the tools that we're all making. Um, I am a mix engineer, a mastering engineer, um, and I'm also partially sighted, which is why I'm leading this conversation today. Um, I'm music support officer at RNIB, which is the Royal National Institute of Blind People. Um, and I also project manage a project called Sound Without Sight, uh, which supports blind and partially sighted musicians and audio engineers. And we'll hear a bit more about that later. Um, so just to start off with a couple of useful definitions um, from my end. Um, and if, if any of you guys have more to add to these, then please do. These are just kind of real kind of nutshell surface level definitions. Um, so what is accessibility? Um, and I think the question related to accessibility is, is it possible for everyone to access the product that I'm making? And going hand in hand with accessibility is usability. So for the kind of user experience, is, is that efficient? And is it equitable for different user groups? And inclusive design is how we get there, right? So that's asking both of those questions throughout the design. So not just afterwards, right from the start. Um, how are we making these products as inclusive as possible? Cool. So now we're going to do our, our show and tell. So first up, we've got Harry Morley from Focusrite. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm Harry. I'm a software developer. Um, I've been here at Focusrite for four years. Um, I love all things music and accessibility. Um, yeah, really excited to be here and to um, yeah share with you some updates, things we've been working on, and also to share with a few a uh, few more things um, to do with accessibility, particularly in Juice, just because that's mainly what I use. Um, so yeah, I think let's um, let's play the play the video. Yeah. Hi everyone, I'm Dan Clark. I'm a principal user researcher at Focusrite Innovation and I'm here with Harry Morley, one of our software developers. And we're going to tell you a bit about what we've been doing in the world of accessibility at Focusrite. So a little over a year ago, we released Vocaster and the Vocaster Hub, which was our first fully accessible piece of control software for an audio interface under $500. Um, but we've also been making some improvements to Focusrite control for the Scarlet third generations. Harry, can you tell us a bit about that, please? Yeah, earlier on in the year, we released an update to Focusrite Control 1, uh, which provides uh, screen reader support um, for uh, controlling things like preamp settings and levels on your Claret and third gen uh, Scarlet devices. Pad toggle button. Pad off toggle button on. Pad toggle off. Pad toggle button. That's really great to hear. And of course, we've recently seen uh, the release of Scarlet 4th Gen, and that's got some new control software with it in the form of Focusrite Control 2. Can you tell us a bit about the accessibility features in that and the development? Sure. So we built um, accessibility into Focusrite Control 2 from the ground up. Um, we were thinking about it you know, every day sort of during development. Um, every part of the app is accessible, um, which enables you to control every part of your interface. Um, we've also got some exciting new functionality uh, for our devices, whereby if you have the software open with a screen reader um, and you touch the, touch the hardware and set some things, it will read out the state of the device as you're doing it. Analog 1, line input, selected. 34 dB. It really feels like a next step up for us in terms of accessibility in our devices. And of course, we have some apps as well, and there's been some uh, updates there as well. 
Yeah, so um, Launchpad iOS, which is our sort of beat creation and um, loop making app, um, it was already voiceover compatible. However, uh, we released an update a short while ago, which provides a way to adjust the color scheme um, to suit your needs um, and also some text layout options uh, for deciding what shows on screen whilst you're, whilst you're playing. So that's a brief update from us at Focusrite and Novation. Thanks, Harry, for telling us about those updates. Uh, we hope to bring you news on further accessibility improvements in the future. Thanks, everyone. So the future is now, and I have another update. Um, which is, um, as of, I think today, very shortly, um, we're sort of re... Uh, we've had a set of plugins, the Red Plugin Suite, that comes bundled free with our devices, um, and we recently rewrote it in Juice, because it was in iPlug before, um, and it's now screen reader compatible as well, so that's another little update, um, which is, yeah, really cool. Um, yeah, um, shall I stop rabbiting on now? Thank you very much. No, awesome news, hot off the press there. Um, no, that's, that's really great. So up next, we've got Tom Poole from Juice. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Tom Poole, uh, director of both ADC and Juice. Um, for ADC, I think it's uh, pretty obvious that we're uh, pushing accessibility at, at every one of our events, uh, although all of the credit for putting this particular session together can go, go to Jay rather than us. Uh, Juice requires a little bit more explanation. So Juice is a software development framework used by a very large fraction of all software that deals with audio or plugins or hosting. Um, one of the things that Juice provides is the ability for software developers to present a user interface to in, in their software to their users. Uh, as of the latest version of Juice, uh, which you'll see a little bit with Harry's presentation, uh, by default, we bind the Juice GUI widgets with the native uh, access access accessibility navigators on each of the operating systems. Uh, so if you're using the latest version of Juice, uh, you may even have accessible software without even knowing about it. Uh, you, you can make the experience much better. Again, Harry, I don't want to tread on Harry's toes too much here. Um, but there's more coming up in the next version of Juice, which we haven't sort of released any re release, date, release details yet. Uh, there's going to be another option of how you can build your user interfaces, and this is using the native web views on each platform. Uh, so now, if you choose this route, then you have the whole uh, ecosystem of accessibility toolkits available to uh, web developers, those, those people building websites, which is uh, a much more well understood and easier to use set of tools. Um, so hopefully the accessibility story there is uh, even brighter. Uh, I, I think that's it. Cool, so who's next? Sorry. <laughs> hey, uh, my name is Adil. I'm from Native Instruments. I'm an imposter also for two reasons. Uh, number one, I'm not a developer. I can't audio engineer. I, I don't know what these guys are talking about. Uh, and number two, because I need to read off my notes. I didn't, um, I'm not prepared enough to talk off the top of my head. I'll do my best, though. Um, so I'm product manager for Contact. I've been at Native for eight years now. I've previously worked on Complete Control. I did a lot of accessibility work there and Machina. I also had a big accessibility release this year. And I'm just going to talk about some of the things that have been going on recently. Um, so first of all, you may have seen, hopefully you've seen. If you haven't seen, please check out our booth. We've just released a new keyboard. So this is the Control S-Series Mark III. It's our flagship um, Big, beautiful device, comes in three sizes. Not a sales pitch, <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, third in its line, um, third to feature, to third that's planned to feature an accessible feature set. So it's not there yet, it's not currently accessible, but it will be from Q1 next year. So in terms of how it's evolved from previous generations, for our partially sighted customers, it has a nice, big, larger, higher definition screen. What that means is, bigger iconography, bigger text, better contrast, all configurable. So just more better, basically. Um, more control at your fingertips to configure things as you see fit. Um, but where it really comes alive is uh, under the hood with our proprietary stack known as NKS, or Native Control Standards. So it's something that we've created. We released it publicly in 2015. It allows us to um, essentially 
give a layer of shine and sheen above what VST offers us at the moment. So with VST, we could have a bunch of parameters and a bunch of labels, and that's about it. And with NKS, with the original NKS feature set, we could extend this to tag-based browsing. We could extend this to uh, pictures. We could extend this to um, colors. We could extend this to better labeling. Um, NKS2, well, well, I don't know if we're calling it NKS2 or not. This, this major NKS update that's coming out with this keyboard is really taking it to a new level entirely. Um, so first of all, the number of parameters has been increased. Um, I don't know if it's gone up to infinity, but it's certainly way more than what it was before. Um, so a common feature request from our visually impaired customers is please allow us to map everything. And you can now map everything, um, probably. I mean, if you have... 2,000 parameters, you may struggle, but I don't know. We haven't gotten there yet. So that's a, that's a really big improvement. Um, navigation's also massively lifted as well. You can jump directly to pages. You've got better naming of sections. You've got better naming of pages. Um, yeah, I mean, that's the extent of what I can share right now, but we're going to begin with working on this very, very soon. We intend to ship this in Q1 next year, so anyone who has a keyboard will be able to fully experience that, and it's like really is the best-in-class NKS experience that we've had so far. And we released the SDK publicly to partners on Friday last week. This is going to be integrated with the accessibility helper as well, which we shipped with Machina earlier this year. And I'll talk about that a bit more in a second. Some of you hopefully know that Isotope is one of the Native Instruments family of brands. And there's been some very good work happening on that front as well. So this year, we've shipped flagship mix and mastering plugins, Ozone and Nectar, with full screen reader support. The screen reader support for ISO branded products is very strong. It's better than the native branded products. It's better than contacts, unfortunately. Um, we released NeoVerb earlier this year. Uh, it wasn't accessible at launch, but shortly afterwards it was compatible with screen readers. Um, it received our kind of gold standard screen reader support, which we're really pleased with. Um, Generally speaking, our screen reader support is developed from the ground up in-house. Uh, we've got really great, invaluable support from community members like Scott, who's probably on the call. In fact, he is on the call, and Matthew Whitaker, who maybe is on the call, if you are. Hello, Matthew. Um, yeah, talking a little bit about the future. Um, accessibility support at the moment, it needs a lot of extensive manual uh, work from the ground up. It requires a lot of expertise. Um, it would be brilliant to leverage some of the off-the-shelf, out-of-the-box capabilities that some of our good friends uh, are, are working on. Uh, this would allow us you know, faster development, less complex development. It would allow less experienced engineers to just get going with accessibility creation. Uh, and also more standardized user experience so that somebody can be using, for example, Focusrite interfaces and then hop straight into our products and just know, how the, know what to expect. Um, yeah, I mean, generally, we've also established a bit of a pattern or an anti-pattern even of uh, releasing a product without accessibility support and going back to retroactively add it in. Uh, this is already a big improvement on where things were eight years ago when I started. So oftentimes, it was a very small cohort of people that were talking about accessibility to, who, um, who really understood the kind of the nuances of the problem and the fact that there are so many people attempting to use our products with workarounds, with third-party uh, tools and whatnot that the community had developed. Um, we've come a long way from that. We are now in the mode of actively discussing accessibility, and it's the majority of people that are discussing it from the very beginning of a, a new product's inception, which is great. Um, the fact that we're oftentimes adding accessibility retroactively is the, you know, the next big challenge that we need to solve. I, I very much aspire us to reach a point where any of our, any of our new products are accessible from day one, really. Um, finally, who was here last year at ADC? Everyone, basically. Awesome. Daniel, you were there. <laughs> Texting away. <laughs> uh, yeah, so some of you may remember um, Jason Descent had a little booth um, dedicated to accessibility. Uh, we did a little demo together of Machina Mark III running fully accessibly um, with the Machina, sorry, with a native accessibility helper application. So that was a prototype back then. We released this publicly earlier this year, which we're super, super happy about. Um, the, the NI Accessibility Helper is something, it's a standalone application that we've de developed. It allows us to improve accessibility independently of the Machina binary software update, which is something that's quite cumbersome, quite complex to release, quite complex to develop, which is great. It means we can do things like improve verbosity. It can improve, we can improve the, um, the vocal cues, we can improve the handling, we can improve the contextual awareness. So at the moment, we have kind of 
one expertise level, which is generic user. Um, but we can eventually cater this towards expert who needs the smallest amount of context because they already know the product inside out. Or beginner, which is help me, I've never used a machine before, I really need to understand these paradigms. And that's really great. I think this kind of decoupling is something that we realized uh, during the development process. And it's, um, you know, kind of unchaining them is something that's really raised the bar and it offers a lot more potential. Um, mastermind, mastermind behind this release was Stephen Penny. Um, he is here at ADC. He'll be wandering around. Come and see us at the Native booth if you want a chat. That's me, thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name's Martin Keery. I'm the uh, VP of product at a company called Muse. Um, the two products I think that are probably most relevant to, to this talk are the open source program Audacity, pretty well known, and uh, Muse Score, and I've run both directly. Uh, still do for Audacity, it's a tiny bit complicated. But um, yeah, I, I, I used to run back a couple of years back, I, I, when I was at Microsoft, I used to run the um, accessibility kind of workshops and did a lot of accessible design for a couple of different creation apps. Um, you mentioned this, it's uh, one of the um, tricky parts of, of, of working on those projects was the interfaces were already built and then we had to go back and retroactively try to uh, apply accessibility to them and it's a total nightmare, it takes forever. And it's really hard to you know, justify it sometimes, you know, with the bottom line and all that because um, it can take like up to a year to get it like fully functional. Um, so then when I left to join, recruited by Dan, thank you, Dan, uh, when I came to MuseScore uh, to begin with, um, it was a really lovely, gratifying experience because I got to reimagine the app and redesign it from, from scratch and kind of build the whole interface again. And then I was able to, for the first time, apply all the stuff I'd learned working on the HoloLens and working on other, um, you know, AR, things like that, and also think apps like Paint 3D, and every single time it was always a nightmare, but in this case, we got to build it structurally properly. Um, the other great thing about Audacity and MuseScore is uh, the open source community. Um, a lot of people put a lot of time into um, just trying to make the app more accessible, and they know quite a lot about it. So we have kind of two experts in either, in either team, and I worked with them directly, and I kind of think the... Um, the results from MuseScore in particular are very, very interesting. Now I could waffle on for ages, but I've got a little video um, that would be nice to share with you. The really fun part of the design process was working on the UI, in particular the colors, which Jessica and I spent a lot of time figuring out. We began by establishing 12 color definitions, each one filling a particular purpose. The color of backgrounds, the color used for text, the color for buttons, etc. Our rule was that everything in the app had to use one of these definitions. Now the trick to the definitions is that they can change their color depending on the context. If the app is using the light theme, button color is this. If it's using the dark theme, this. This means that when we design something, all we have to do is create it using the light theme, and the dark theme comes for free. We also created one special color definition called accent color, which allowed us to provide theming options for people to choose from. Now the other reason we built the system was accessibility. In particular, a customizable high contrast mode for users with various different kinds of visual impairment, like low vision, poor contrast perception, or color blindness. This particular design was implemented by a community member called Arjun Taneja. Thanks Arjun. Actually, it is worth deviating from the UI just to talk about accessibility for a moment. I worked a lot on accessible design while at Microsoft, and when I came to MuseScore, found a kindred spirit in our community member, Peter, who had done a lot of accessibility work in MuseScore 3, and who later on joined our internal team too. Together, we designed a new system for keyboard navigation, which, along with our expanded screen reader support and ability to export in Braille, makes MuseScore 4 much more accessible for blind users compared to version 3. And it's worth mentioning that much of this was made possible due Let's check out a new accessibility feature coming soon to MuseScore 4, a live Braille view. You will have the option to view Braille within MuseScore via a new panel below the score. For sighted users, the Braille will show up in the panel as actual Braille dots, no special fonts required. For blind users with Braille terminals, the Braille dots will appear on your refreshable Braille display. So we have on the screen a string quartet and I can use the computer keyboard and MuseScore in the normal way with the screen reader. And I've also got a Braille display, which will show me some Braille music when we ask it to. Let's hear first what the speech says as I cursor through this score. So I'm pressing cursor right. 
Note of five crotchet. Bar one beat one staccato above staccato above tempo allegro assai dynamic P. The speech you heard was from the screen reader. Now, the braille display is also showing the words that the screen reader spoke. Again, quite a lot of information to take in. It's a G5 crotchet, bar two beat one, etc., etc. It's great, but you're reading one note at a time. So there's a lot of information to take in about each note. And if I want to learn a whole piece, there's quite a lot to read through. If I press tab, I'll get to this braille window. Live braille, normal mode edit. And on the braille display, it now shows live braille, normal mode edit. That's what the screen reader just said. But afterwards, I've got in braille music notation, a whole bar. Staccato, fifth octave, G, crotchet, staccato, F crotchet, staccato, E crotchet, staccato, D crotchet. And all of that information is in that little space between my fingers. Wow, so a lot more compact. A lot more compact, and I'm reading the whole bar at a time, rather than one note at a time. We need the speech and the braille because it gives you the choice. You can either use the speech, or you can use the braille, or you can use a combination of both. What's really cool, not only can I read Braille music on the Braille display, I can also write music into MuseScore in Braille music notation, and it will appear on the screen as print music. Now I do that using six keys on the laptop keyboard, S, D, F, J, K, L, in different combinations representing the six Braille dots. And I'm gonna press dots one, three, five, or S, F, and K. Yeah and a C quaver, F, and a B quaver. J, D. How is this helpful for a, a blind person and a sighted person to work together? I guess you can see each other's language. There's a lot of music teachers out there who, who can see, and they might have a, a student who can't. The teacher can't necessarily read Braille themselves, but it's useful to refer to what the student is actually reading. It might even be vice versa, by the way. You could have a blind music teacher who has a sighted student. So it's useful to be able to see what each other see. Yeah, I just kind of finish off by saying, um, first of all, thanks to the ADC for putting this on because it's, um, you know, it's great to, that this is sort of talk is happening and I, I understand you're doing it quite regularly or you intend to do it much more regularly, which is fantastic. And um, <clears throat> I can just say, you know, uh, again, the open source thing is, is quite useful because we get a lot of um, volunteers to kind of test out uh, the sort of stuff you looked at there. And it is always really, it's a bit abstract when you start trying to build accessible stuff. You read a lot of documentation. It's all really, okay, well, we have to kind of do this thing. But it is really gratifying to actually go and watch someone actually use it and, uh, and benefit from it. And thank you for it, you know. Um, so anyway, I'll just leave it at that. Hello, I'm Arvid Jans and I have worked at Softube for two years now as a plugin framework developer, which means I basically program everything except uh, DSP. Uh, and among the things I do, I have done uh, uh, the screen reader integration for our hardware console one. If you're not familiar with the console one, it's basically a channel strip plugin controller. Uh, so what the screen reader integration does is basically whatever you do on the hardware, if you press on a button or turn a knob which change a parameter, the screen reader says what happens, basically. And what we have done that we did last year, I think we released it. Uh, and what we have done the this year, basically, is we have developed the Console 1 Mark III, which we are releasing, basically. Now I'm not sure if it's available in stores just yet, but soon. Uh, and uh, I have uh, transferred uh, the screen reader integration from the Mark II to the Mark III, so at release it will be fully accessible. Uh, although it's highly possible that it's, it's not quite as polished as Mark II, since we haven't... Uh, I think we got the actual units to the to the office around one or two weeks ago, so we haven't been able to send them out to our our testers. So no uh, no blind people or uh, have actually tested uh, the accessibility just yet. But uh, that will happen soon. I I hope we had 
amazing help from Jason Descent uh, designing the, the screen reader integration for the Mark II, and uh, he'll hopefully help us once again. Uh, the, the, the biggest thing, I think, for accessibility on the Mark III compared with the Mark II is uh, all the potentiometers, the knobs on the hardware are touch, touch sensitive. So you, instead of actually changing a parameter to know what the parameter is set to, you can only like tap it and you get the value. Uh, and I have also recently final, finally implemented the settings because people that need accessibility need settings. They are individuals, so they <laughs> like, they need different amounts of the help, basically. Uh, so uh, uh, settings, for example, how much to be read out when you touch uh, a knob or how much when it should be re uh, read out only when you turn the knob or when you touch it. And also, uh, for example, uh, how much should be read out when you select a, a, a track since the... Uh, I think the original implementation was that when you choose a track on the console one hardware, we read out the track number, the track name, and then the channel strip that is loaded on the current track. Uh, I did g get some feedback uh, from users where that it feels too slow. I don't really need to know the, the actual track number. Uh, so now I have implemented, uh, which will also be available for Mark II users that you can basically, you can, you can choose which order you want those three parameters when you choose uh, a track and you can choose which one you want to be read out, basically. So, uh, oh, and we're also now started working on the Mark III fader, which is our fader unit with 10 faders. Uh, and I will make that accessible as well. I have begun with that work, and I think it will be available when we release that as well. Uh, that's mainly the things that we have been working on regarding accessibility. Yep. Thank you very much. Cool. Well, what, what an amazing array of stuff there. And it's not over yet. We've got three online panelists as well. Super, super lucky to have such an amazing panel. Um, so firstly, Athan, are you there? Yes, I am. Hi. Cool. We've got you. The floor is yes. yours. Great. Um, so um, my name is Adam Billius. I don't know if you're going to play the video or I can just walk through this if you want. Yeah, if you do you want, want me to just 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 press play? Yeah. Yeah, and then and then I'll I'll introduce myself after the video. Okay. Sure. The MIDI Association is the global nonprofit 501c6 trade organization that connects the companies who develop MIDI products and new MIDI specifications with all the people around the world that create music and art with MIDI. Our corporate members include OS companies like Apple, Google, and Microsoft, DAW and notation software companies including Ableton, Avid, Bitwig, Steinberg, a whole range of, of different DAW companies. And of course, also software companies like Native Instruments, Spectrasonics, Arturia, Juice, uh, as well as hardware companies like uh, Roland, Yamaha, Korg, Focusrite, and Moog. In addition to our corporate members, we have special interest groups. A special interest group is a community with a shared interest in advancing a specific area of knowledge, learning, or technology. We have three special interest groups that are active right now. The Interactive Audio Special Interest Group, which focuses on the game audio community. The MIDI in Music Education Special Interest Group, which is working on giving away a curriculum uh, under Creative Commons license. And our newest and we think most important special interest group, uh, which is the Special Interest Group on Music Accessibility. The Music Accessibility Standard Special Interest Group is led by Yuho Tamanian and other sight-impaired musicians and producers, as well as contributions from Native Instruments, Arturia, Audio Modeling, Roland, and many others. We meet bi-weekly and are looking for more companies to join the drive to make music more accessible to all. 
Okay, uh, I'm Juho Tomenen and I would like to tell you about my history in music. So I started the music journey by uh, studying the theory and practice of piano playing and classical ages from church to postmodern classical music at the Soisala Music Institute and then I started dealing with the digital audio workstations like Reaper and keyboards like Motif XF7 and the biggest challenge was that there was no screen reader so as a blind person I couldn't know where I was on the menu and uh, um, what I instrument was selected and then the idea of, idea of music accessibility standard was formed and then in April 2023 we formed the Music Accessibility St Standard Special Interest Group whose chair I am and our main goal is to uh, improve software and hardware accessibility for people with disabilities. It's a really nice thing. Here are the bullet points for MIDI 2.0 and later on at the Audio Developers Conference uh, there'll be a MIDI 2.0 seminar but what we'd like to focus on is making uh, MIDI easier to use with MIDI 2.0 and how that relates to the music accessibility standard. The most important thing about MIDI 2.0 is that it makes MIDI easier to use. And how does it do that? MIDI 2.0 changes MIDI from a monologue to a dialogue. New MIDI 2.0 products can talk to each other, discover their mutual capabilities, and auto-configure themselves. MIDI 2.0 works harder, so you don't have to. One of the three P's of MIDI 2.0 is profile negotiation. A profile are a defined set of rules for how a MIDI device sends or responds to a specific set of MIDI messages to achieve a specific purpose or suit a specific application. For example, be a piano, use MPE, respond to orchestral articulation messages. But what we'd like to focus on is developing a profile to enable accessibility for people with different accessibility challenges. We'd like to invite you to join the Music Accessibility Standard Special Interest Group. You can do so with the link below or by putting your camera on the QR code, which will take you directly to the form to enroll by indicating your interest in one of the MIDI Association's initiatives. And you can also just send me an, in, uh, an email uh, at info at midi.org, I-N-F-O at midi.org. Uh, hopefully uh, that will be uh, something that, you know, one of the things about accessibility is it's very hard to imagine all of the places. And I realized when I put a QR code uh, in the video, it was totally meaningless to a, a lot of the people that we're, we're trying to reach out to. Uh, so full disclosure, I am also not an audio developer. Um, I have worked in product planning for many years. I was the product planning manager for the Korg M1 and then was the pro uh, worked very closely with Yamaha on the Yamaha Motif series. And the Yamaha motif uh, ended up being the uh, the instrument of choice for a lot of musicians who were sight impaired uh, for for an, any number of reasons. And you know, got a chance to work with some very famous uh, musicians: Stevie Wonder, Ellis Hall, a, a lot of great musicians, but also uh, just everyday people who were struggling with uh, the user interface. And so one of the things that I've seen as kind of a theme here is uh, what I call adaptive design. Uh, and so we're hoping that we can work uh, with all of the companies that are in the MIDI Association to develop a profile uh, for accessibility. And, you know, we can get into the details of how that would work uh, with a profile. Uh, the profiles are very well defined inside of the organization. And what we would hope to do is to develop uh, a profile, of course, give the profile away because all MIDI specifications are free to use for everybody, but also hope to encourage our members to develop some open so uh, source software together and provide that uh, code uh, uh, available. We're, we're doing that. We, we have embraced open source in the MIDI Association now. 
there's going to be an open source Windows driver for MIDI 2.0 coming up. And so, you know, we we feel it's important that accessibility means that the the code is available to everybody. Uh, so that's it for me. Cool. Thanks very much, Athan. Um, and AD, are you there? I am. Can everybody hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got you. Perfect. Um, hello. Uh, so, yes, uh, thanks uh, uh, for joining us today. It's really nice to be part of these things, and I'm always very happy to participate when invited. Um, I am AD Dickens. You don't have to use the doctor. Um but I do have a background in accessibility and audio. So uh, I'm not a complete, complete imposter here today, but uh, I don't do uh, programming. I'm not an audio developer. Uh, my C++, you definitely wouldn't want me building anything for you. Believe me, it'd be very bad. Um, but yeah, I was an audio engineer. And after my degree, I specialized in computer science and uh, have a PhD in accessible digital musical instruments. And uh, I've been working with Ableton uh, in-house for the last 12 months, but uh, as a consultant for the last three years. So we've been working on improving accessibility overall, which is something that we haven't really been known for over the years. And we're the first to hold our hands up and say it really wasn't good enough. So uh, what can I tell you about what we've been doing lately? Well, um, first, I'm actually really pleased to uh, this last month has been a bit of a milestone for us with uh, our Note app, which is our musical idea kind of sketching app that pairs with our DAW software live, but it's a complete thing in its own right. You don't have to have live to be able to uh, use Note or own Note. And uh, yeah, so it's, it's on iOS and We've recently just finished the uh, kind of foundational work in making that compatible with voiceover. Like everybody has said here, it's it's kind of upsetting to have to retrofit and it does take time. But um, in just under a year, we went from that being completely unusable with voiceover to now having um, a really strong voiceover user experience. And um, I was really pleased actually last, last month that a review went up on Apple Viz that said it's possibly one of the most accessible music production apps on iOS, aside from maybe GarageBand, which is Apple's obviously Apple's own product. So I'm really pleased that the work that we've done over the last 12 months has really uh, shown up um, for this. And it's available also in, I think, six languages now, English, German, Japanese, French, uh, uh, five languages, and Chinese. So... And it's available in, in all the different app stores. Uh, you'll be able to find it there. Um, but yeah, I'm really excited that we've, like I say, it's the foundational start for it right now. I'm not saying it's the best thing out there. It definitely has room for improvement. And I'm working constantly with our testers to keep improving this. And week on week, uh, we're kind of digging into the actual music making experience of it and not just the navigation or anything else but like really going into workflows and finding those points where it like stumbles and what can we do to make that as equitable as an experience to anybody who's using the app with the visual interface like what can we do to make sure that there's no delays and that everybody gets the same experience um i'm also uh really pleased to tell you that um our main uh, software live, we've been working away on a private beta for this for just over a year that we've had this in the hands of some testers. And the last few months, it's been really in test. And um, we have made that so that it is accessible to screen readers. It has high contrast profiles for low vision, and it also has an extremely improved keyboard navigation. So you can use it with many other assistive technologies beyond screen readers. And um, I'm very excited because that is actually coming out as a public beta very soon. So I do encourage you all to uh, keep watch on ableton.com. Check that out over the, the next few weeks. And uh, uh, yeah, you're, you should be able to, if you want to be part of uh, joining the public beta, uh, the public beta for this, we'd be... Um, extremely pleased to invite you all in. Um, I really love 
doing this work. And um, I am absolutely, uh, you know, forever thankful to the amazing people that we have worked with over this last period of time in, in making things more accessible at Ableton. And I um, just have the utmost respect for their musicianship, their contributions to uh, our accessibility uh, improvements and just the, their continued contributions to making that um, making that possible for us. So, yeah, I, I think that's all I have to share with you. But definitely um, reach out to me if you want to talk more about this stuff. I, I'd be really happy to hear from you. Awesome. Thank you so much. And last, but definitely not least, um, we've got Scott Chesworth. Scott, are you there? All right, all right. How are you? Uh, ill and full of tea. I'll try to get through this without spluttering too much down the mic. Um, so, hey, everybody. I'm Scott Chesworth. I uh, was supposed to be there today. Hopefully, I'll be there tomorrow. I think the Lurgy is on the retreat. I'm just still a little bit too wobbly to make it today. Um, so I'm not here repping a, a particular company, really. I'm more here repping screen reader users. And I suppose you could say rookie developers. I'm going to be taking a lot of notes during uh, Harry's presentation. Um, so uh, a little bit of background about what I spend time doing here. Um, I've been uh, doing digital recording, um, production, mixing, mastering, all that kind of stuff for like 20 three years I think this year uh, and for a lot of that time access to plugins and virtual instruments especially with screen reader software was was really like a big chink in the armor um, a, a really kind of big weak spot in the arsenal uh, and what we had for for the longest time like for the majority of the time that I've been doing this what we had was automation parameters in each DAW, right? Um, and the, the problem with that was that whenever you would get a new plugin or a new virtual instrument, um, you'd have to kind of go to the developer because most of the time they just sort of made a few things automatable that, you know, they thought would be handy. Well, when that's your only method of interacting with a, a plugin because the GUI wasn't accessible at all. Um, you had to kind of go to the developers and say, hey, look, like this this thing that's just kind of a convenience for you is like my bread and butter, man. So can we talk about this like entirely separate UX that you, you now hopefully have got time to design? <laughs> um, and so the the big leap forward, I guess, in the last few years from from my perspective has been Juice uh, making uh, an, ex an accessibility API so that like GUIs based on Juice can be made accessible now. Now, there are still some plugins out there and some instruments out there built on Juice where there's like, where Juice is essentially a wrapper, right? And there's there's some custom control sets out there in the wild still that don't expose much uh, to screen readers. And yeah, so it's not, it's not a done deal. Like, uh, I think you're getting that from all of the presentations today is that like, no one's saying, hey, we fixed it. Okay, cool, we're done. No one's saying that yet. It's it's all still a work in progress. But from my perspective, as someone that runs like a ton of um, community sourced uh, support resources and and that kind of stuff, like on a on a typical week here, I'm interacting with you know at least a few hundred, sometimes up to a thousand screen reader users um, across the different groups that I either run or administrate. Uh, for us as, as, as blind people, screen reader users, whatever you want to call us, to be able to now approach developers that build on juice based, uh, that build on juice especially and say like, Hey, this, this is almost usable. It could be a little bit nicer if you just do this and this and this, a little bit more productive for us if you do this and this and that. That's a huge step forward. Um, and it really makes a difference and it's, it's spawned like a lot of momentum. Um, just the the tone across like the various accessibility support groups and stuff has changed so much in the last couple of years. I would say, 
to from from being like a here's all the things that we can't do. What a shame. Um, it's changed now to more like, hey, has anybody tried this? It's, it looks pretty pretty close. Like, let's get in touch with someone and see what we can figure out. Um, so yeah, that's I I spend a lot of time here doing like that advocacy stuff, um, and I'll be I'll be floating around ADC uh, over the next couple of days. Um, uh, big on open source stuff. Uh, I think things that I've just quickly things that I've had a, like a, a pretty big hand in over the past few years that have that have turned out really well accessibility wise would be Asara, which is open source accessibility for Reaper. Um, we are pretty widely adopted now, uh, been translated into like 10 languages and there's probably more coming. It's all community sourced, uh, community led, everything's open source. Um, uh, Surge XT, not my development work this time uh, at all, but um, was one of the people that got that conversation started. Surge XT is a wicked free open source synth. Um, probably the first time screen reader users that I'm aware of, the first time screen reader users have been able to design like synth patches entirely from scratch. Um, and there's tons of there's tons more juice based stuff, especially that kind of keeps keeps popping up. Like uh, with with a lot of this, a lot of the uh, open source folk leading the charge, it's great because it means you've got like code examples that you can point people to, right? Um, and so, you know, Chowdhury DSP, most of their stuff is accessible. Uh, Sonobus, uh, Delay. Um, yeah, I could go I could go on and on. Uh, but that's that's my experience of it all. Um, and, and so what the future looks like here is essentially keeping plugging away at the advocacy stuff. Um, uh, but I think... Over the next sort of year or so, my focus is going to be shifting a little bit to looking at like the front end, like the acquisition process of of getting our hands on virtual instruments um, and, and plugins, making sure that like the purchase processes, for example, are accessible, uh, and, and especially making sure that like if there's anything that needs to be enabled for accessibility to work, that that is doable independently as a blind person um just because that is i think that's the thing that i see being overlooked the most at the moment when i'm talking to developers and that kind of stuff it's like it's a it's a whole separate conversation sometimes to go okay cool now how do how do how do people enable that themselves <laughs> um and you'd be surprised how late that gets thought about in the process i think sometimes so that's kind of where my my focus is sort of my pet project over the next year or so to make sure that that conversation happens sooner. Uh, I think that's me. Cool. Yeah, I think that's a really big point that we'll we'll definitely pick up on later in the panel discussion around like, you know, there's this really, really good work that's happening. There's lots of it in different patches, but how well is that propagating out to the rest of like a product's life? So can screen reader users, they bought this thing that's supposed to be like really great, really accessible, can they actually install it? Is that kind of that process accessible itself? Can they update it? Because, um, yeah, there are cases where that isn't happening. Um, so, yeah, that's it from our panel for now. We've got some um, video updates from across the industry now. Um, so I put a call out when I was originally putting this session together, and there was really, really good response. And I, I think there's some really valuable stuff to share um, for people who unfortunately weren't able to make it today. Um, also kind of some... I guess weighs in for the kind of third sector as well. So there's a couple of charities represented in this video doing really good work, and I, I really wanted to give them the give them the floor. So here we go. Thank you so much to everyone who submitted a video to be included in the workshop. I think it's real evidence of the momentum of accessibility in audio product design right now. First up, Jim Rand explains how Cinevos is supporting other developers to design their products inclusively. Hey, I'm Jim from Cinervos, and we're an audio software development business that helps other developers build products through our SDK and consulting services. And that's allowed us to work on some really cool projects with customers, as well as some of our own sample apps that are inclusive by design because they translate between the senses. So for example, we've started collaborating with a company building a heads up display for glasses that translates audio into text for people with hearing loss. 
And we've built hands-free walkie-talkie apps where you can control the whole experience with audio or by touch and texting, which allows users to communicate with one another using whichever mode makes sense for them. And that could be different for each user. And one of our main goals is to make building these sorts of products easier by creating an ecosystem of third-party libraries that can be snapped together like building blocks. So you may want to try out different speech-to-text and text-to-speech models. And perhaps depending on what's being said, you'll want to toggle transparency in your headphones on or off. Or perhaps selective transparency to let certain sounds in and block others out. Or perhaps have specific sounds recognized in your environment to trigger a change in the transparency. So you need to string several building blocks together to make that work. And what excites me is to see all the things people are going to build when we hand them all of those building blocks. And we're doing that now with companies from headphones and hearing aid manufacturers to social app and music tech developers. And in general, I think there's a huge opportunity in translating from one sense to another because in the last few years, models have become really good at understanding and generating audio and images in real time. So if I have trouble hearing, it's now possible to have an always on microphone that recognizes specific sounds and can translate those into visual cues. Or if I have trouble seeing, I can have an always on camera that helps to provide audio cues. And so in the last couple of years, it's become technically feasible to experiment with new products that translate between the senses. And our goal is to work with developers to make that experimentation and innovation process faster. Next, Pierre from Arturia provides an update on their accessibility work. Hi, it's Pierre from Arturia. Uh, and I've worked on accessibility for a couple of years now, starting with Animal Lab, which is our most popular software, including all the instruments of the collection and pigments. A uh, simple interface with a seamless integration with our MIDI controllers that allowed us to have a really powerful accessibility at first. But this was only the first step, and we're not working on making our whole software ecosystem accessible. So now browsing and uh, parameters addition is possible on all the V collection and on FX collection uh, effects. But we are also working on making the whole uh, Arturia Software Center accessible to make installing and updating software possible to everyone. And then we'll uh, progressively add deeper accessibility to all our software to, to make it possible to everyone to design their own sound. So this process of making uh, our software accessible is really a learning process and we are going step by step. Uh, we are trying not to, to rush it because once a feature is made accessible, we can't really go back and we can't make it not accessible anymore. So we really need to do it properly every time. So it takes time, it takes effort, but we see uh, very positive feedback every time we make something accessible and we're going to keep pushing it. And now for something slightly different, I asked musician, composer, accessibility consultant and generally awesome human being Andre Louis for what he thought would be the most valuable thing to share in this workshop. And he came back with something that wasn't audio related at all, but a demonstration of how quickly blind users can work when software is built with keyboard navigation in mind. My challenge to you is to put your mouse down for an hour. Let's use Mac keyboard shortcuts. You can find a lot of these here in the Go menu in Finder. All right, let's go to our Applications folder, Command-Shift-A. You want to get to a specific application? Let's say Logic, L-O, type it. You don't have to scroll. Let's open it, Command-Down-Arrow. We're in Logic right now. Let's minimize this for a while or hide it, Command-H. Let's close this Applications window, Command-W. We're back on the desktop. Let's go to where all our drives are stored, Command-Shift-C. Here are all my drives. Let's go into one of these drives. Command down arrow when you've got it highlighted. That's it. You can use up and down arrows just like normal. Let's go back out of the drive. Command up arrow. Closing it. Let's go to downloads. Command option L. Here's a text file. Let's review the text file. Command down arrow. What does it say? Don't you just love keyboard shortcuts? I do love keyboard shortcuts. Okay, let's quit this. Command Q. New finder window or new window in most applications. Command N. Very cool. Let's get rid of that. Get rid of that one as well. How about Documents? Command Shift O. iCloud Drive? Command Shift I. Library folder if you've got it set up. This may not work for all of you. Command Shift L. 
the utilities. Command Shift U. So you don't need to use a sidebar, do you? Mm -mm. This is very useful. Command Shift H, home folder. And one of my favorites, Command Comma. This is global and works in many, many Mac apps to bring up Mac's preferences. Hope you find this useful. I have to admit there, Andre was speedier than me, a mouse user, for every one of those functions. Next, we hear from Tim Yates about Drake Music's work and his top tips for designing inclusively. Hi, my name's Tim Yates. I am Head of Research and Innovation at a charity called Drake Music, which is a national charity in England and Wales, working at the intersection of music, tech and disability, supporting blind, deaf, disabled and neurodivergent people to make music. As part of my job, I'm responsible for our instrument development program, our research program, and in general, trying to make music technology more available and accessible to everybody so that everybody is empowered to make music. It's great that this is happening at ADC. It's great that there's such momentum behind making music tech accessible at the moment. Great strides are being made and it really does make a huge difference. I was just wondering if you could share a little bit more about your work and why it's important that mainstream audio products are designed inclusively. So a lot of what we do is bespoke instrument development. We work with musicians to develop new instruments that enable them to make music the way they want to make music. Even when we're building bespoke instruments, we're often relying on a whole chain of stuff to make it work. Audio interfaces and doors and plugins and all of the things that everybody uses to make music. So it's really important for us to be successful. All of those components work well and are accessible themselves because without that, if there's a weak link in that chain, it's hard to make a really successful solution. So something you and I have spoken quite a lot about is the importance of communication with end users during development. What are your thoughts on that? The people who have by far the greatest level of expertise in this are the musicians themselves. The person who's trying to play music, who knows what kind of music they want to make, who knows how they want to make it, and who knows what their barriers are to making it. So with that in mind, when you're developing something and you're thinking about access, the best thing you can do is to talk to people. Talk to a user group, talk to your community of musicians, see what works for them, see what doesn't work for them, and try and make your solution as accessible as possible in that context. Everything is context dependent. One piece of kit works differently from another piece of kit, and what might work in one context might not work in another context. So the more that you can communicate, the better. A corollary to that is to share the access information that you have as far as possible. The more people know in advance what your kit or your software does or doesn't do, may or may not be accessible for them, may or may not be useful for them, the better it is. You want to try and avoid the situation where somebody has to buy something in order to find out whether it does or doesn't work for them. The more that you can share, the better. Awesome, yeah, for sure. I was wondering whether you had any quick inclusive design top tips for our attendees here today. I've asked around a few musicians and also from my experience at Drake Music, the kinds of things that crop up. I've come up with a short list of five things that can really help with access. There is a much longer list, but I think these five things are a really good starting point and are broadly applicable across a lot of different bits of hardware and software. So the first thing, something that comes up a lot, is the use of multi-press. That is pressing more than one button at the same time to make something happen. This is generally inaccessible to quite a lot of people, and the more it can be avoided, the better. In particular, with mode switches and things like that, with that kind of thing, you can really render large percentage of the functionality of an otherwise really useful and really great piece of kit inaccessible um, and unusable for someone. Number two, second point, we all know that clicks are expensive in user interface and any kind of interaction design. In accessibility, clicks are even more expensive. So the more you can remove the number of clicks to do anything, the better it is and the more accessible something is. So, you know, thinking about that all the way through the design can really make a difference. Um, in particular, uh, access settings. Are your access settings themselves accessible? Try not to put them in four levels down in your menu structure or, you know, at the bottom of the fifth tab on your settings page or something like that. A third point is try and stick to standards where you can. If you're if you're doing something that is a standard functionality um, across lots of different bits of hardware and software, then just try and do it the way that everybody does it because um, 
if somebody's got a particular bespoke rig that's expecting that, it can be really difficult and tricky to have to adapt to a particular piece of hardware or software that doesn't follow that basic structure. So try and avoid that where possible. The fourth thing is to try, if you can, to have transportable settings. So, you know, somebody might have a particular way of working that works brilliantly and they have it set up on their home machine in their home studio or the home performance rig. But as soon as they move into a commercial studio space or somebody else's rig or another performance space, they can't take those settings with them. And so it um, becomes very difficult for people to use those kinds of spaces. So if you can make your settings transportable so that somebody can carry them with them and set them up on a new machine in a new environment easily, that can make a massive difference in terms of the flexibility that people have to work in different places. The final thing, and this happens more often than you might think, try not to remove access features, especially without telling people that it's gonna happen. It does happen that there's a particular access feature that might get removed between version 1.2 and 1.3 or something like that. You know, somebody might be relying on that for a core part of the functionality of their rig and it suddenly disappears without warning and it can be a real problem to resolve that. There are scenarios sometimes when people end up getting trapped in old versions and then as a consequence get trapped in old operating systems and then as a consequence get trapped in old machines and it can really have a large knock-on effect. If you do have to remove it for some essential reason, then try and tell people and communicate that so that people have the opportunity to find a workaround before it happens or, you know, they can feedback on another way that it could be done. So I hope those are useful. If these things were implemented widely, then they really would make a big difference to uh, the accessibility of music tech in general. So please do bear them in mind. Thanks so much, Tim. Um, if you want to learn more about Drake Music's work, you can go to the website at drakemusic.org. You can also reach Tim by email at timyates at drakemusic.org. One of the things that Tim mentioned there was multipress. And with that in mind, I thought it'd be useful to take a quick look at Digit Music's Composer MIDI instrument, which was designed using the mantra, one finger, one click. In other words, all functions were designed to be accessible using just one point of contact. Composer is a MIDI instrument, meaning it interfaces with music apps, pro studios and software, much like a traditional MIDI keyboard, but with a few key differences. Traditional keyboards take musical understanding to know which notes to play. With Composer, you set your key before starting, so only the notes that sound good are available. Chords are made by playing more than one note, so on a traditional keyboard you need masses of dexterity to play. With Composer's chord mode, each movement of the joystick plays multiple notes, making it accessible for different body types. Traditional keyboards are often large and unsuited to modern music creators who want to make music on portable devices. Composer distills the power of a full-size keyboard into a handheld instrument that connects wirelessly, perfect for beat makers on the go. Next, we look at Open Up Music's new software instrument called the Clarion and get some insight into its design process. Hello, my name is Ibrahim and I go to Chasgrove School in Bromsgrove. I use a head tracker and a metal dot on my chin to play clarion on my computer. At first, I found it hard to control the mouse. It was hard to keep it still when I wasn't supposed to be playing. Here, I used a blue switch under my chin to mute myself and give my neck a rest. With practice, I got much better at controlling the mouse. Now I don't need to use the switch because I can use the on-screen head tracker toolbar to mute and unmute, click, drag, double-click, etc. This means I can edit patterns and create new patterns 
myself. Before I join Open Orchestra, I have never used a head tracker ever. And I found using an eye gaze really tiring. And now I use the head tracker not only in music but in all my lessons. It means that I can be independent and do some of my work all by myself. It makes me feel confident. It makes me feel free. My name is Barry. Um, I'm the Chief Executive at Open Up Music. I've been heavily involved in the development of the Clarion pretty much since day one. It's been pretty much 10 years in the making. And the basic premise was that we didn't know what we were going to build. We used something called participatory design as, as our approach. And participatory design recognises that the people that are going to be using the end product are experts. They're expert designers, they're experts in their own experience. We didn't want to create something in isolation. We wanted to work alongside young people. We wanted to work alongside teachers and educators and music leaders to create something that was really fit for purpose. So what we wanted to create was something that was affordable, something that could run on the technology that young people might already be using in their lives and something that was super simple to use. That's cool. So you're really trying to overcome barriers that were present in other music technology devices and instruments. Um, what would you say makes Clarion different to other instruments? Most musical instruments are fairly fixed. And in many ways, you have to subjugate yourself to the musical instrument. You need to put yourself in all sorts of weird and wonderful shapes to be able to play it. And that works for many musicians, but for some, that's simply not an accessible option. So the clarion is a very flexible musical instrument. First and foremost, you can interact with it in whichever way is most appropriate to you. So if you're a musician that uses your fingers, you can use your fingers on an iPad. If you're somebody that uses your head to control a computer, then you can use your head to control the clarion. And if you're somebody that uses an eye gaze system, then you can play the clarion with your eyes. Um, but you can also change its layout because if you imagine navigating a typical musical interface like a keyboard with your eyes on a computer screen, that's very challenging. There's a lot of notes on there that you might not need. So at an entry level, you could have one shape a musical shape like a square on an iPad and that square could cover the whole screen when you touch the iPad it makes a sound when you take your hand off the iPad it stops making a sound and from there you can build the complexity up we wanted the clarion to be as immediate as a piano might be to make a sound as in you can just put your hand on it and it'll make a sound but we wanted it to be something that could take a lifetime to master that's awesome. So it grows in complexity with the musician. Um, do you think you would dare to label the clarion as fully accessible? I, mean, I think one thing to note is that what we're not saying is that the clarion is the accessible musical instrument that can open up musical access to everyone. For a lot of musicians with visual impairments, it's not that useful because it's a very visual musical instrument. All of the notes are represented as shapes on the screen and the layout isn't fixed. I don't think you can create the musical instrument that is the accessible musical instrument because obviously everyone's needs are so different. And for people here who might be engaging with accessibility for the first time, um, what would be your top pieces of inclusive design advice? It's an observation about design that I think a lot of people will be familiar with, which is that clarity and apparent simplicity are really complicated. You know, having something that's really intuitive, having something that is very clear and easy to navigate takes a long time. So, yeah, I guess the main principle is to give yourself more time than you think you may need and to involve end users at every single stage of the design, development and deployment. Next up, 
we look at Audio Modeling's implementation of screen reader accessibility using Juice. I like how they've allowed users to search parameters and menus for quick navigation. The video also explains their inclusive music project. Audio Modeling develops its products in an accessible way thanks to the voluntary work of a group of blind beta testers, coordinated by an accessible analyst, employed by the company, who is responsible for verifying the accessibility of each new product released and collecting feedback for products already on the market. Each product was developed with the GIS Audio Application Framework through the integration of specific APIs for software accessibility and the navigation was customized based on the feedback received from users and the group of volunteers. In addition, the team is working in collaboration with the Universita Degli Studi di Milano, Laboratorio di Informatica Musicale, LIM, and the Musica Senza Confini Association to an inclusive music project that will harness the benefits of MIDI 2.0 to enable users with varying levels of ability or skill to perform together. Firstly, Audio Modeling demonstrates screen reader accessibility within their Audio Modeling Software Center app, allowing users to install software. Audio Modeling Software Center Window Username Editor M -M -U -P -O -R -T. AMS up password edit mi mi middle mi middle mi middle mi middle dot link login button button login audio modeling software center window entering swam string sections version 1.0.0 double bass cello viola violin sections group now screen reader accessibility in their swam string sections software instrument Touch and assign button, mapping table button, presets button, presets button button. S M P S preset item for MPE default. Swam viola section window. Inputs button button. Search button bu swam viola section win P L A Y. Players act bow. Swam play mode play mode. Bow on. Pizzicato off. Pizzicato radio button not checked. P close button. C close button button. And a brief overview of their inclusive music project. Ciao computer. Turn on the lights. Hmm. I would like to create some music today. Hey Mario, great idea. Do you have anything in mind or would like to start from a template? Yes, uh, I was thinking to have a drum and bass groove. Okay, do you like this? Mm, no, try another one please. How about this? Cool, that one is great. Just reduce the level of the drums. Okay. Done. Shall we add another track? Maybe let's add a piano, yeah. Uh, a chord progression of uh, D minor, G7, C major 7. Do you like this? That's good. Save it for now. I think I will record the piano myself later. The product we want to develop is certainly challenging, an ecosystem that includes operative systems, frameworks, 
Vocal Assistance, MIDI 2.0, Data Collects API, Artificial Intelligence, and different kind of products and services. As part of this, audio modeling consider how different user groups might interact with products and how these groups' access requirements might be mapped to profiles within MIDI 2.0. We'll explore this more in the panel discussion later. So we have started uh, already implementing um, a prototype. Basically, it is an inclusive MIDI controller, which allows you to map uh, um, different pads with, uh, with different colors, uh, and to map them to joystick, uh, game controllers, keyboards, eye tracking, and we started a, a research activity on uh, user experimental design. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you all. Now, a message from RNIB about inclusive design trends in the wider technology sector. Hi, everyone. I'm Robin Spinks, Head of Inclusive Design at RNIB. And I'd like to wish you a very successful and productive audio developer conference. I've worked at RNIB now for over a decade and working as head of inclusive design, I've got the privilege of looking after a team of specialists who work across the tech industry to create change, to develop accessibility solutions and to deliver products to market that are inclusive and accessible. And it's absolutely vital that we do the same for the audio industry and we make sure that tools that you're using and products are accessible and usable and out of the box and not requiring retrofitting or expensive alterations. We believe that that's possible because we firmly believe that blind and partially sighted people love music, love music production in the same way that everyone else does. And actually we want to ensure that careers in music and music production are open to people and are attractive and there aren't unnecessary accessibility barriers. We've worked with lots of different parts of the tech industry. We're living in an incredibly exciting time as we see generative AI and machine learning and haptics all developing to new levels, promoting new levels of opportunity, new levels of independence. Just look, for example, at the capability of ChatGPT or Bard from Google. Look at the capability, what these tools can deliver to make life easier and to improve access to information, to describe pictures, for example. So really hoping that you have a great conference and super excited to be working in this space, to be working with the audio industry, and really looking forward to hear what the outputs are from the conference. I wish you all the very best. And remember, simple adjustments can make big changes. Think about the possible but also think about what seems impossible. And through collaboration and partnership, there's always a way forward and there's always a solution waiting to be achieved. Thanks very much and have a great event. And finally, a little plug from me for the Sound Without Sight project. Sound Without Sight is a new online community hub designed to connect blind and partially sighted musicians and audio engineers to share information and support. Here's one of the project's new interns, Zenny, who explains why the project is important to her. I'm Zenny and I'm a blind singer, songwriter and voiceover artist. I've been singing and writing songs from a very young age and I've been doing voiceover work for the last couple of years now. So it's really important for me personally that music and audio production tools are accessible because without them I wouldn't be able to carry out my work and I wouldn't be able to express myself through my music. And I think for a lot of other blind and partially sighted people it's the same because for example a lot of us use screen readers and magnifiers so it's important that software such as Logic and Reaper are compatible with those I've worked with some exceptional audio engineers and music producers that are blind and visually impaired. The thing to consider is that with the right tools in place, there's no limit as to what we can do. And why do you think it's important for a project like Sound Without Sight to connect the community? There are already some accessible tools out there, but the information to access them isn't always easy to find. It's not as easy as just a quick Google search. Half of the things I've learned so far are through word of mouth from other blind musicians. 
So I think coming together is really important and also to showcase what we've learned because we'd be helping a lot of other people with the right information. It opens up so many opportunities, especially like in terms of jobs and in the education sector as well, because it gives us all the equal playing field. And I think that's really important. So Sound Without Sight is building up a knowledge hub for all things music and audio accessibility related. If you'd like to, you can get involved at soundwithoutsight.org. Cool. So, so many like different projects there, so many different areas of work. And I think it would be really good just to have that chat later about how we can tie some of that together and try and create some like positive forward motion and, you know, share some of these kind of bits of work and, and, and the learnings from them. Um, so that's it from our panel for now. Um, up next, we've got, got Harry's headlines that I called it. <laughs> um, so we're going to look a little bit more into uh, inclusive design in juice. Um, shall we disperse the panel? Is that probably best for now? Do you want me to stick around? Uh, yes, yeah. please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. All right. Headline set time. So um, this will be a jazz set. No, it won't be. Um, well, it will be partially improvised. So I guess there's some similarities there. So um, I'm doing a talk on Wednesday called Building a accessible and Accessible Juice App. Um, today, I'm basically going to sort of whiz through it, maybe tailor it slightly more for this, for this session. Um, but if you want to learn more, if you feel like you didn't quite get enough uh, info, feel free to come on Wednesday. I think it's at 11.20. Um, so, um, yeah, just out of interest. So, I guess, um, just in the room, um, let me just see if we can, like, uh, work out what we're going to do first. Um, just to give you a chance to stretch your legs quickly, if you can. Um, if you're a software developer, stand up or raise your hand. Just, if you're, yeah, 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 cool. Okay, okay, got quite a few, okay. If you're not, stand up and raise your hand. Just trying to weed out the, uh, the shy software developers that aren't admitting to it. Okay, okay, cool. I think let's dive in. I think let's dive into um, uh, some code, okay. If, you, if you're not a software developer, um, this is, um, it's going to be very easy stuff. Just one-liners and just like calling simple things with simple names. Um, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. So, is my... You're seeing my whole display. Okay, cool. So, um, this is going to be interesting. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, right, let's go Command F1. Okay, you can now see the Hubble stuff. Okay, great. Are we going that way? Yes, we are. Okay, that's going to have to do. That would be wonderful, actually, just to give me the assurance. Yeah, yeah, maybe don't twist to the actual screen. Um, do you need a hand? Okay, great, thanks. That's, that's perfect. Yeah, yeah. Can people over here see okay still? Yeah? Is that okay? Okay, great. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, wonderful. Cool. Okay, so it's half three. Nice, 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 nice. Cool. So, okay, today we're going to go into the basics, very basics of making an accessible juice app. Um, not going to have a chance to go into absolutely everything. It's going to be a bit rushed in places, but we're just going to skim over the top just to give you all a um, an overview. So, um, yeah, everyone's welcome here, developers, non-developers. Um, there's going to be some insights in, like, testing as well as the code. Um, so, yeah, uh, the goal today is to share, yeah, small kind of specific examples that you can take, build from, consider um, when making a juice app. Um, yeah, there's multiple ways to achieve the same thing. Um, and also, yeah, I'm still learning as well. So let me know if there's anything I can uh, improve on. Um, so 
Uh, this probably won't apply so much. Uh, let's. Um, uh, yeah, so we're going to focus mainly on stock juice components um, and the traditional juicy way, uh, C++ way of GUI app development. Though, um, as yeah, Tom mentioned, as maybe and maybe I'll um, chat about other options towards the end because I do have some thoughts on the matter. Um, but yeah, um, maybe you're a beginner to juice. Maybe you've already got a, a juice plugin um, that's written in C++. I just thought. Um, yeah, be good to share some things that I've learned along the way. Um, so, yeah. Cool. So I'm using Mac, Mac OS primarily. So it's going to be Mac-centric today and using VoiceOver. We're going to try using VoiceOver live, which should be, should be fun. Um, however, the concepts are portable. And um, it, yeah, uh, mostly applies to um, the same concepts on Windows screen readers as well. So, OK, cool. Um, you know about me, it's fine. Um, right, so there is a repo if anyone wants to now or later. There, are, uh, there is a public repository on the Focusrite group. Sorry, I don't have a link. Um, I need to put that in the slides for Wednesday. Um, the Focusrite, Focusrite group is the org, and you'll see it. It's called Accessible Juice App ADC 2023. Um, feel free to um, clone that, check it out in your own time. Um, the slides are on there as well, including PDF and uh, HTML as well, um, if you need um, to look at them yourself. So, okay, right. So, we're going to start with an app. Uh, give me one sec. So that's going to switch to there. You can now see everything. So, um, right, initial commit, everyone's first... Uh, Commit message. Um, OK. So actually, uh, what I might do now, I'm going to turn on voiceover just to check levels and stuff. So um, let's see if we can hear it. Voiceover on code. Okay. Application CPD. Cool. Access. Great. So um, who uses a screen reader? Out of interest. A little bit? A little bit. Yep, I occasionally do for development. Um, there's going to be, OK, cool. A anyone occasionally use screen readers for development? Yeah, OK, OK, OK. Oh, nice, nice, very good. So I fall in that category. I don't rely on a screen reader uh, day to day. Um, but I've picked up, some, picked up some tips and tricks, which hopefully I'll yeah, share my perspectives on. Um, first one, control will silence voiceover dead in its tracks. So if it's about to say something very long, you can just hit control. I'm going to use that quite a lot today. Um, there's some interesting patterns I found working, particularly in the sort of post-pandemic world, pair programming with developers on Zoom, trying to debug screen reader issues with voiceover. It can get quite chaotic. Um, so knowing how to do stuff like that um, is very useful. And I've got a few pragmatic things that I'll maybe touch on in a sec. Um, yeah, anyway, uh, enough waffling. I'm going to but launch the debugger for the selected target. Juice. I'm going to live build, which is so risky. Why am I doing this? Um, of course, it's configuring. Great. OK. Um, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna trust it and leave it to go. I do have some pre-built versions, but I think let's just uh, let's get it going. Uh, so it's just acquiring juice right now. So what we're gonna do is whilst that's building, um, is um, let me just check one. Application. Code. Yeah. So we're gonna build the app and we're gonna run it, but we're not gonna use the mouse at all. Um, we're gonna assess the accessibility of this app. So I've built basically a um, small kind of audio related application. Um, you'll kind of get the context. Uh, it doesn't do anything, it's just a bunch of buttons and sliders, but hopefully it kind of, yeah, uh, yeah, it's kind of relevant to things you do. Um, this is still going. This is just classic live, live television stuff going on. Um, I'm going to give it a few more moments, but then I'm, I, might, I might bail and use my pre built uh, binaries. Uh, yeah, yeah. OK, what I'm going to do is I'm going to. Speech muted. 
be the speech temporarily. We'll come back to that. I'm going to get that just to configure but not run. See if we can build that in the background. And whilst we wait for that, I'm going to go to my handy Blue Peter style directory on my desktop, um, which is some binaries that I built earlier. So um, what I'm going to do is open this, um, open this app. OK, right, let's put the speech, speech on mute. OK, cool. So OK, so if you can see the screen, you'll see we've got some stuff on there. Kind of, kind of looks like a mixer. Um, very, um, yeah, very basic. Didn't put much effort into the into the design. Sorry. Um, let's see what happens. So, Mac and Windows screen readers both can use use Tab right to navigate. There's there's different ways of inter interacting in VoiceOver. You can also use the arrow keys with the VO key the voiceover key, which is, depending on what you've set it up as, is either control, alt, sorry, control option, or a caps lock key, or both. Um, but let's just try using tab, because that's what everyone's going gonna, to gonna try using. So, right, OK, so I'm pressing tab, and nothing's happening. So we'll, we'll try alternative methods in a sec, but that's quite a big problem, because on Windows, for example, tab is very common. It's, you, it's very often you just use tab to move around. Um, there are other things as well, landmarks and such, but yeah, tab's not working, so that's not great. OK, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask Jay to hold the mic, because multi-press is going to be needed. I am a pianist, but I'm not a rack man enough. Um, so yeah, big hands. Um, yeah, OK. So I'm going to use the VO key, which I've got as caps lock, and the, um, the arrow keys. Off. 48V button. OK. 0 dB. Vertical slider. OK, so, so we've got some, some stuff there. So, so this is default juice accessibility. I did no effort into the accessibility. I set up my components. Um, some are text buttons to have the text in there. So if, if I go... Off. 48V button. OK, cool. 48V, that makes sense. Phantom power. OK, cool. 0 dB, vertical slider. OK, so that's not, I don't know what that is. Oh, it's dB, so I can kind of tell that it's you know, some sort of decibel thing. It could be level, it could be gain. Um, let's just keep going. So I'm going to go right. Off, 48V button. Oh, OK, it's another 48V button. That's a bit confusing. What, what's that for? Oh, did we just had another 48V button. Let's go again. 0 dB, vertical slider. Uh, same again, what? OK, so I'm just going to keep going. Off, four, 0 dB, off. 0 dB, C, vertical slider. C, OK, uh, slider. C, vert C, vert C, vertical, 0 dB, vertical slider. OK. 0, 0, off, M, button. M. Off, S, button. Mark Spencer, I don't know. Off, um, M, off, S, but off, off, obviously, S, button. Obviously, sorry, joking apart, like, you all have the context for this. Like, what, 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 what do you think MNS is? What do you think? Mute and solo, right? So you've, you've inferred that from the, the layout. It kind of looks like a channel strip, visual layout. But going straight into this, off, I mean... M, off, S, button. Yeah, we're going to need to improve that slightly. Um, OK, so let's... Um, Speech muted. Let's, out of interest, see what happens here. Build finished with... Oh, yeah, that's not going to work. Great. I'm pleased I, re I built those things. All right, let's go back to the demo. And thanks. OK, cool. So there's going to be a few slides, depending on how, we, um, how, how we're doing for time. There's a few stages that we're going to go through in this app's development. Um, and the commit history corresponds with like, adding like, improvements. So we're going to go along and improve this app. Um, you can quickly check out um, the um, the commit uh, with the, the thing on the slide at the bottom. Um, I was going to use the commit char, but I couldn't because I had to keep rewriting history, and that changes the char every time. So, yeah, that was annoying. Um, testing accessibility. So I'm just, I'm just going to touch on this. So there are some tools for testing accessibility. Um, and namely, they are the Accessibility Inspector on Mac, which comes with Xcode. Um, it's built in. Once you install Xcode, you get 
you get the uh, accessibility inspector. And in the Windows, um, there is the conveniently, conveniently named accessibility in sites, um, which um, you can download um, from the website. Um, so these tools are great. I'll show you them in a sec for, um, they're very good for quickly interrogating your application to find out what accessibility information it reports. Um, they give you a lot of information, um, sometimes a bit too much, and they're particularly useful for sort of inspecting the hierarchy um, of your components. Um, they're very good debugging tools, but I don't think they're the best way to verify the accessibility of your application. The best way is to use it yourself, and obviously it goes without saying, have others use it. But today, I'm mainly focusing on the sort of developer workflow, um, because as I said, it goes without saying, we need to be um, testing our software with testers, and we at Focusrite, we've got a great beta pool um, with some screen reader users who have provided some amazing feedback um, along the development of um, Focusrite control. Um, but yeah, we're just going to focus on the sort of development side of things. So use a screen reader for a more representative, representative experience. Um, uh, yeah, so these are the main ones. Um, there are various surveys, such as the, the WebAIM one, it's quite interesting, that um, seeks to um, quantify screen reader usage. Um, but these are the main ones. People will expect to use them, be able to use them. Um, I know that Juice doesn't uh, officially support um, uh, JAWS and NVDA right now, but um, for the most part, um, things seem to work. There's a few quirks, um, which I won't be able to go into today, but, um, but yeah, um, hopefully we'll see more, yeah, better support in the future, and also there's other ways of doing things, so it's all good. Um, so as I was saying, um, I picked up a few ways to streamline your experience. So you can, there's often built-in tutorials um, for learning how to use a screen reader. I've, I did the voiceover one. Um, it's very useful. Learn the shortcuts. Um, as Andre um, uh, was mentioning earlier, there's tons of shortcuts for things on Mac particularly. Um, it's very good to pick up on those because you'll get an insight into how um, different people will use, use your, your application. But in the um, context of screen reader usage, yeah, learn how to quickly turn it on and off so it's effortless, just to quickly check something as you're building your app. Um, turn up the speed if you wish. It's quite slow by default. Um, know how to silence it whilst keeping it on. Um, there's also something you can do which I, I help as a sighted person. I quite like, and I don't have this on, on constantly, but you can set up uh, speech mute quite easily because the caption panel that shows shows exactly what voiceover would read out. So you can, you can toggle it, hear it, you can see it. There's lots of different ways to interact with voiceover. It's not just the voice. Um, particularly useful on Zoom calls, as I was saying earlier, because you might want to keep checking the focus ring and check things are traversing properly. Um, so yeah, so you can temporarily mute speech. Um, you can do that uh, in voiceover utility. I think I've got a yeah, picture. So voiceover utility, you go to commanders um, and keyboard, and you can basically set up a key um, to use with option to like toggle, toggle speech. Um, Jason Dason um, taught me that one. So thanks, Jason, for everything. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, it doesn't completely mute. So the, 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 the voice mutes, but you still get the lovely clicky sounds that you get from voiceover. So you still get that feedback which pans around depending on where the thing is on screen, which is great. Um, I don't, don't know if anyone's ever noticed that. It's wonderful. So back to the demo. So there are a few issues we just found. So we couldn't interact with the keyboard alone. We could eventually, but not initially. So tabbing wasn't working. However, I could then use VO plus arrow keys. I could also click the mouse in the window um, and that, um, that seemed to sort it out. So not quite right there. Titles were missing. There was, there was grouping confusion. It was like we keep, kept seeing 48V buttons, but it's like, wait, what's this, what's this in relation to? A couple of minor points. Um, 
there were a few buttons that said on, and they were changed to off when you when you toggle them. But it wasn't clear that they were toggle buttons; it just said button. So probably want to make that um, a bit clearer. Um, pretty small point. Um, I noticed on um, if you use um, draw, the draw screen reader, depending on the particular role that the button is, it will often say that you can use the space bar to trigger the button. Um, which is something we found from beta testers, actually. They were saying, you know, um, uh, how, why can't I use the space bar? It's saying I can use the space bar. So something con to consider adding that shortcut. Might not make, sen make sense for your application, like a DAW space bar is probably going to play the transport. But for our, for our app, I feel like we could, we could add that extra way in, right? We're just trying to add more ways to interact with our application. Um, sliders weren't receiving keyboard focus with tab, so we're going to sort that so we can go through every interactable component with tab. Um, and the focus order was a little, a little bit strange, so let's, we're going to sort that out in 14 minutes. Okay, so let's fix the initial keyboard interaction. So, right. So slightly counterintuitive fix. I was actually talking to Tom earlier, and I'm going to catch up with the Juice team after just to, so we can figure out what the actual what's going on here. Um, but it's slightly counterintuitive fix, which is on the document window, which is what I'm using um, uh, to create the application window. I don't think this will apply to plugins as much. And I know that there was actually an improvement made um, the other day to do with the initial focus. Um, um, with the document window, for some reason, you have to, you have to call set once keyword focus false. So the producer does this. So I was like, oh, OK, I'm going to do it as well. And it seemed to fix it. Um, the, um, how many times has someone like looked at the, what the producer does and then just, yeah, okay. Um, there is another way, which is a bit more explicit. So this is nothing to do with whatever Juice is doing. You can explicitly grab the main content component in active window status change, and this sorts it out as well. But I'm not going to be able to go into too much depth here, um, luckily for you. So, okay, so let's... What I'm going to do, I'm going to, I'm going to go through a few points, and then I'll show you the fixes rather than keep jumping back and forth. Um, so titles were missing. This is a super easy one, um, so much so that I didn't have any content for it. Um, set title on juice component sets the title. Give it a clear name. Um, you can, so the text buttons in juice um, will automatically take the text that you give it as the title. But for example, we have those buttons that were M and S, right? We kind of want that to be separate. So we can call set title separately and say this is mute um, because there isn't the visual context of this is a mixer channel strip, et cetera. So we can, we can use the long form there, um, whereas it's sort of abbreviated. Um, so we're going to call that mute solo. Um, 48V button was already OK because that's just the text. Um, the sliders. So we're going to just call set title on all of those. And I'll show you that in a sec. But let's, let's carry on. Um, should I go to the next one? No, let's stop there. And I'm going to make, um, make those changes. So you can now see my desktop again. Uh, how's the old configuring going? <laughs> no, no, it's saying no. Don't worry, don't worry. OK, cool. Back to our build. So um, we're going to fix the initial window focus um, just to show you in the code. But I did just um, mention what I might do is I'll switch the commit. So we're now on, we did fix application window stealing initial keyboard focus and add titles. So let's have a look at that. So. We just call set once key or focus false on the document window. Um, that will then not trap the focus. It will carry on down. And we then set title. We've got pan on our pan slider. Um, we're now in channel strip, the source code for our channel strip. Um, set title for gain, level. You get the idea. So let's run that up now. Um, OK. So, speech unmuted. Let's press tab. Off. Mute button. Okay, so it now immediately gets the keyboard focus. We don't Off. have to do Solo any other button. tricks. We don't have to 
click in the app or, or use different shortcuts. So, okay. Off. 48 V button. Okay, so. Off. Mute button. So we're just going through the buttons with tab off. right now. Solo. Off. 48 V button. Off. Mute button. We got mute and solo. That's solo good. button. Okay, cool. Um, could you hold the mic again? Cool. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, off. Mute button. Zero dB. Level vertical slider. Level. Okay. C. Pan vertical slider. Pan. Okay. That's C for center. Um, yeah. Zero dB. C. And C. then we've Pan got C. Zero dB. Gain vertical slider. Gain. So that would be like preamp gain or something on the mixing desk. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to VO and left through this. Channel four. Group. Okay. Off. 48. Zero dB. Gain Let's vertical slider. Let's just go through slider. that again. Off. 48 V button. Channel four. Group. Group. Okay, so a group should afford being able to go into such group. So let's try and go in. So to, to do that, we do VO shift and down, which is to interact or to, to, to go into a group. In channel four, group content is empty. Content is empty. So that's kind of confusing because there's nothing in that group. Um, however, it does look, it does seem like if we go out. Zero dB, gain vertical slider. There are some components. C, and pan vertical slider. C, C, pan vertical slider. There's four sets of them. So something's still not quite without grouping. So we need to sort that out. But we've fixed a few things. We've got titles. We've got uh, initial focus. That's great. So Speech muted. Let's go back. Whoop. OK. Um, I'm going to skip past focus containers. Come on Wednesday if you want to know more about that. Um, Okay, fixing the buttons. Okay, cool. Um, so we want to make the buttons announcers toggle buttons so it is clear that they can be toggled um, rather than just sort of inferring that there's an on and off that's changing. Um, we can use the toggle button role. So, um, so the problem here is um, we're using the stock juice text button, which is reasonable. We, want it, we just wanted to use a quick, quick juice component we want it to look like a text button, so we're going to do that. But it doesn't. Um, it will always just announce as being a button um, because maybe text buttons were just designed for single fire actions. But hey, we want it to toggle. Okay, sure, we could use a juice toggle button, um, but that was kind of more for if we're just in the stock look and feel realm. That's a bit more for sliding toggles or preferences. Um, so we want to make a text button that can be a toggle button. Um, we could refactor our button to make it a juice toggle button, but then we'd have to go down the route of rewriting the text drawing and the layout, and the text button's doing it all nicely for us. So we're just gonna we're just gonna do that. So how do we just make it make it work? So we need our button to announce as having a toggle button accessibility role. So quite a lot of what we're doing when we're making things accessible is we're basically just saying this component is here, it has this name, it has this role. Um, and here is how you interact with me. That's, that's essentially what it all boils down to. Um, it does that through the accessibility handler. I'm not going to go into so much depth today on the uh, accessibility handler, but we'll do a quick, quick fix right now. So we need to override create accessibility handler in our component. So maybe we've got a custom button class that overrides um, juice text button just to get that going. But, um, oh, thanks. Um, yeah, um, where was I? That's probably a sign that I need a drink of water. Um, OK, so um, we've got a custom button class, override juice text button, and we want to create an accessibility handler it will return a handler which announces all those things that I just mentioned. So, um, so this is what accessibility handler looks like. You give it a component, the role, and then the actions and the interfaces. That's sort of the nitty gritty of how it gets set, how the, the value gets reported. Um, so we need to override that. It returns a unique pointer to an accessibility handler. Um, so if we were to just write that from scratch for our button, we kind of end up rewriting the juice one, uh, which is about 100 lines long. We haven't got that time right now. So what can we do? So no need to reinvent the wheel. Um, you guys are going to hate me. Um, 
The, um, the, the juice button accessibility handler is available in the detail name space. So we could just pull that in. Um, it is juice implementation detail, so it could change, caveat. Um, but it's a very specific class, so maybe that's what we want. Um, it could be removed in the future, but then we can just write our accessibility handler. We're, but we've got five, wow, we've got five minutes left, so we haven't got time to do that. So I'm just going to pull that in um, and return the button accessibility handler, which lets us set the role. So I'm going to say, oh, is it, toggle, is it toggleable? Cool, it's a toggle button. So we'll do that. Great. Um, just while we're on the buttons, um, let's make the space bar trigger the buttons. So don't use add shortcut. That doesn't do what you think it does. Um, add shortcut is more akin to the um, uh, command handler stuff, where it's like you want to set a command for a particular, like a uh, command S for save or something. Um, what we want to do is basically override the key pressed for our button because that will then handle um, uh, when the component has focus, it will it will respond to that key pressed message. Um, so um, yeah, I, I've seen a couple of people on the forum trying to use add shortcut. Um, but what will happen is if you, it will only work on the first one you call add shortcut for, um, which is yeah. So we're going to use key pressed, nice and simple. Get the key. Um, we're just implementing key press basically, and we're just adding space, um, and then that will trigger the click. Um, yeah, if we want to do that. So, um, okay, and then quickly, we want to allow tabbing over sliders. Um, so the default um, stock juice slider does allow this, but it puts focus to the um, the editor for like typing in the value. Um, when I was making this app, I turned that off because I just didn't. I just didn't want to deal with that right now. I was just like, we can see the value. Let's just make the slider go up and down. I'll come back to the editor stuff. But that means we need to make the slider the thing that moves accessible. So we're going to do that. Um, so this is the allow sliders uh, to get keyboard focus commit. Um, let's see where we're at. So we've done three things there. Apologies, it's very whistle stoppy. Um, let's go back to here. Um, so, okay, almost there. Two minutes. Whoop. Okay. So, what did we do? We made the channel strip a focus container. Oh yeah. Um, so channel strip. You just call set focus container type and make it a focus container. There are two types of focus container. If you want to learn, know more about those types, come on Wednesday, we'll go into more detail. But for all intents and purposes, we want it to contain um, the things within it. The, um, we're going to have a channel strip, which is a rectangle, and then we've got the things inside it, pan, gain, buttons, all of that. And then we're setting the title on that group and calling it channel one, channel two, et cetera, um, which you can see here. We're calling set title, and then... We've got, when we're setting up our slider, we're saying, yeah, it wants keyboard focus. Um, and what was the other thing? Space bar. Well, you saw the implementation. Um, yeah. Quick function. Saves having to write 100 lines. There we go. So where are we at now? Um, Speech unmuted. OK. So 48V off toggle button. So it started on 0 dB gain vertical slider. It started on gain. 48V off toggle then button. Went phantom power right left. Okay, fair enough. C, Down, and vertical slider. Went to pan. We can um can you hold the mic again? Thank you. Caps um, lock on. Oops. Caps lock off in vertical slider. So we can now change the change the pan. One six percent L. Five seventeen percent R. Great. And we can come out. Out of vertical slider. And we can tab. Mute, off toggle button. Solo, off toggle button. Mute, 0 dB, level okay. vertical slider. We can, we can come out of the group, so VO shift up. Out of channel 1, group. Channel 1, OK, cool. If we go VO and right. Channel 2, group. Ah, OK, channel 2. Channel 3, channel group. Three. Channel, channel 4, group. Channel 4, we can now go in. In channel 4, group. 
648 um, off toggle button. The grouping is much clearer. Okay. So, um, right. Okay. Have I got time just to do the last point quick? Okay. Speech muted. Great. So, thing I mentioned um, just now, let's close all these instances. Um, it went gain first. Sorry, it's a bit small. And then and then phantom, but we kind of expect it to go left, right, in our uh, bias of Western writing systems, we probably think left, right would make more sense. So how do we sort focus order out? And just more generally, maybe we, we might have a more complicated, this is not a very complicated layout, but we might have a bit more complicated layout. So how would we, how would we sort that out? So, let's fix a strange focus order. So, by default, the GS keyboard focus traverser goes top to bottom, then left to right. So you might, depending on how you're drawing your component, you might run into issues. Um, and what I mean by that is, say, for example, we've got two components. They're rectangles. They are side by side. The left-hand one is horizontal. Right-hand one is vertical. Um, spatially, since the, since the, the default um, traverser goes top down and then left right, um, it's going to pick the right-hand one first because it has a higher top position. Um, and that's because of the way we're currently drawing this component. It draws right up to its bounds. Um, but second example is the same two rectangles. However, they are drawn within... They are, the components are actually square, and then we draw the rectangles within that. Um, pros and cons are doing this, but... This, these are different ways of doing it. Um, this way, the left-hand one will go first because they both have the same top position. So it will then go left-right. So it's then going to pick the left one first. So something to consider in terms of if you've got a funny focus order, maybe good to look at how you're actually drawing your component. But what we've done is this, and we just want to fix this. So how would we do that? So there's a few few solutions. You can manually set the focus order on a component. So you can just do set explicit focus order. Uh, it starts at one. Um, you can do that. Um, you could make a cust completely custom keyboard focus traverser. Um, I've never actually had to do this. Um, it's possibly overkill for kind of static layouts because it requires you have to make a whole class and I mean, it's great that you can do this. Very flexible, but it's it's useful for very dynamic things. You have to keep you you keep you have to keep track of like component pointers and stuff, and work out what the next one's going to be. So maybe there's an in between. So something um, a colleague of mine, um, James, um, devised was a nice little utility for kind of semi-automatically um, setting the focus order. Um, so oh yeah, that that's that's how to do it very simply. You might have like 10 components. That would be a bit of a faff to try and go through and set explicit focus order. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You might forget how to count. I do that occasionally. Um, so what if we had a neat little utility like this? So you make a little instance of this focus order class. Um, you give it starting with, so you give it the component, and then you can just keep calling then this one, then this one, then this one, and you can just make this whenever it needs to change. Um, if you've not got that many components, this would be quite a nice. Um, I'd recommend doing something like this. So to make one of these, uh, we're not going to be able to go into too much. Um, here's a uh, reductive uh, implementation emitting the various constructors and deconstructors and rule of fives and 42s and whatever. Um, basically, um, we've just got a um, static method called starting with, which sets up an initial order um, index of one. And then when you call then, it re keeps returning another instance of this. And it increments the counter as it goes up. And then it calls set explicit focus order. So it's just this manual set explicit focus order. But it just, just makes a slightly nicer interface for it. So yeah. Um, OK, cool. I haven't quite done it yet. Let's uh, quickly demo the app. Do, 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 do. Do, do, do. Um, 
yeah, I won't show the code. Let's just go for it. Builds, final version. Screen reader accessibility demo. Screen reader accessibility demo. Window, 48V, off. Toggle button has keyboard focus. Cool, so we're on our toggle button called 48V. It's the top left component. We can interact with it. On, 48V toggle button. Great, we can turn it on and off. Zero dB, game vertical slider. We've got gain. C, pan vertical We've got slider. Pan. Zero dB, level vertical slider. Level. Mute, off toggle, solo, off toggle button. Mute solo, groupings there. We have significantly improved the accessibility of this application. This so, Facebook application screen reader accessibility demo. Code, finder, arc and screen reader accessibility demo. Speech muted. There we go. I'm um, actually going to turn voice over off. Voice over off now. So, um, we did it. It was just excuse to you, the carp streamer emoji. Um, but we did it. That's great. Um, so, yeah, just quickly, further reading, thoughts. Um, Ed, uh, who's now not with the Juice team, unfortunately, but he made a um, uh, great talk at ADC 2020, I think, or 2021, about what's happening behind the scenes with Juice. Um, it's very, very interesting. Um, and, yeah, as I was saying, web views are gaining popularity. Perhaps consider it. It depends. It's not going to apply to everyone, but... Um, I've played around with it, and it's, accessibility is just naturally better just because it's more declar declarative. Um, but yeah, tricky decision to make, lots of things to, 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 uh, to weigh up. Um, yeah, and just a quick mention to Sudara's a melatonin inspector, very cool juice module that basically attaches to your app, and it gives you a kind of inspector-style window, sort of like accessibility inspector, um, which didn't, we didn't get to go into today. But it's a bit it gives you a bit more juice specific information about your the order of your components, etc. It's very cool. Um, I'd recommend that. So Q and A time. Um, firstly, I was wondering, easy one to start with. Was there anything out of all the stuff that we've seen and heard so far? Because I know it was a whistle stop tour of like loads of different concepts and things. Anything that stood out particularly to anyone here? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, uh, this might seem like a strange uh, one because it's not really something anyone mentioned, but it's probably because of the headspace that I am in at the moment. I mentioned during my previous ramble that I was working on uh, different uh, uh, settings for Console One's screen reader integration. Uh, and uh, during uh, Harry's uh, demo, I, I noticed that... Uh, the value w uh, was spoken first, not the name of the control. And I have been like racking my head for possible uh, different settings. Uh, and I hadn't come across that because it felt very intuitive uh, to me as cited to speak. Uh, the the name of the control first and then the uh, the value uh, of course that's what you what's the best is for an actual user to uh, uh, evaluate uh, but uh, uh, it seems like a good setting to let them uh, choose basically if they want the name first or the uh, value first so I think I'm gonna implement that in class one and I also, I'm just hijacking uh, the fast, uh, quickly. Um, uh, I feel the need to correct myself. I said that the console one is fully accessible. I meant it's accessible for uh, a visually impaired user. There are sh surely many more faults with console one that it doesn't. Yeah, I'm, I'll blame that I'm not a native English speaker. Uh, and it doesn't work for uh, Windows at the moment. So if anyone, because we don't use Juice, so if anyone has experience with the UIA framework, talk to me, please. Okay. <laughs> would, you, would you like to go first? <laughs> uh, so um, the thing that kind of resonated me, with me most out of all of those updates is that I thought uh, Tim's fra Tim from Drake Music, his sort of five big takeaways or th five th key things to think about uh, were just spot on. Uh, and I've, I've never really heard such a succinct list which hits all of, all of the really big points. So maybe 
uh, come back to the recording of this session and go go over that again. That's it. Agreed. Um, one point that inspired me. So when Martin was talking about the work they've been doing with MuseScore to make that more accessible, um, he described a design system without using the words design system. Um, I like design systems because you put some, in, some work in up front, you do some investment, you think about what are the patterns we want to create here and how is this going to scale, and then hopefully, in principle, the idea is you don't have to do any thinking ever again because uh, the rest of it just solves itself. Um, it's never occurred to me that that sort of thinking is also something that can apply to accessibility, screen reader, um, paradigms as well, but especially when seeing what you're doing with Juice. Um, I don't want to say there's room for copy-paste, but there's room for some kind of upfront thinking. So you really define your paradigms, and then when you get there, when you get into the weeds of implementation, much of it hopefully takes care of itself because of this thinking that you've done upfront. So design systems are good. We should use design systems. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, just if we're talking about highlights, I thought um, the open up music video um, was just awesome with the sort of visual thing where you move the cursor around. Um, got me thinking that um, um, he, um, I can't remember what the guy's name was, but um, he was saying about, okay, it's, it's, it's very visual. However, I think there's another way of looking at it, which is that there's a difference between purely visual and something that's spatial. And I think that's something interesting. Um, and it's kind of where things are going at the moment with you know spatial operating systems and all this kind of stuff. But like the, the core idea of that um, being spatial, um, where things, objects exist somewhere where you can move to interact with them, that core idea is still accessible level. Um, but it's just, yeah, the current implementation is a, a visual way. So I, I think it's, um, yeah, I, yeah, the, yeah, that's all I've got. Thank you very much. And I think, yeah, something we touched upon there, Adil especially, um, is this like thought about, you know, how do we kind of push on from this moment? Everyone's doing quite different bits of work, but it's all really valuable. Um, I'd really like to spend a little bit of time before we go to the audience um, talking about what potential there might be for a bit better kind of collaboration. Um, I think it's almost, you know, with this panel here, we're preaching to the converter because everyone here is doing great work already, but is there anything that we can do together collaboratively to get some kind of design, I don't know if standards is the right word, but some guidelines and just a way of kind of documenting the good work that's happened to support the wider sector, the wider industry. So there might be independent developers, junior developers who want to do this stuff, but it's just quite an overwhelming topic. How can we work together, do we think, to provide that kind of helping hand? Anyone on that? Yeah, I, I, I'd like to jump in on that if I could. Sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, the, the, the MIDI Association, it's not, in this case, it's not about MIDI. Um, we're simply, you know, the reason we put together the Music Accessibility Standard Special Interest Group was basically to, to create a vehicle for everyone to get together and talk about this, whether it has to do with MIDI, whether it uses a MIDI 2.0 profile or not, it's just a place for people to get together. Uh, and so, you know, that's all we're trying to do. Um, We've tried to put some infrastructure to it. So we have a, you know, we have a forum where people can uh, talk about it. Uh, Jay is is in that special interest group. Martin Martin Creary was the uh, the host of the MIDI Innovation Awards. Um, and, and Tom is actually on uh, the special interest group for the interactive audio special interest group. So, you know, we are happy as an association just to provide that vehicle for, for people to do it. Um, and we want to support anything uh, that that is is you know is bringing music accessibility forward. It's great the work that Juice is doing. Juice is very important because it is a platform that so many so many developers use. So we just encourage everybody to you know to contribute 
and work together. The last thing we want to do is have people going off and doing things separately and standards are the way to get things done. Thank you very much, Athan. Did you want to speak any more about the potential for MIDI 2 and uh, profiles? Or do you feel like we've got that covered? I think there's, look, that's act, that's called doing the work. Um, you know, there is a lot of work to do in developing a, a profile using MIDI 2.0, but the, the ability for devices to communicate with each other and configure themselves is is very powerful. Uh, and I think that working with all of the companies that are in the MIDI Association, I think that we can we can do something that's very interesting. I don't want to go into the details of profile details, inquiry messages, <laughs> and how you know those can be used to to configure things. But but I think that there is the real possibility of of using, and so many things do use MIDI and music production. It seems like a natural thing. Um, and and the work that audio modeling is doing is is great, but we all need to work together. That's my really my main point. Let's just work together on this. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Ad, did you have any thoughts on this general topic? I know you've done a bit of thinking in the past. Um, yeah, where where are you at right now? I am a thinker. Yes, <laughs> um, I actually I'm on the fence at the moment about whether a standard is the way forward, because I feel like actually some of our problem is that many of us aren't speaking the same language because many of us don't have the understanding of accessibility. Like you say, at the moment, it's still very much a field that's kind of supported by experts and consultants and finding uh, a universal language around this uh, is something that I think will help people to gain better understanding and to make it more approachable as a topic. And something I think that we can do that with is is first establishing like a, a taxonomy of terms, like understanding what exactly it means when we say something is a high contrast or what it actually means when we give a specific label to a thing so that people can take that label, understand it, and both the person who's built it knows what specification it has to meet and the person who's consuming it can go, okay, I know this will work for me. Um, until we have the same understanding of those terms, I think it's very hard to create the specification behind which we achieve them with. Um, but again, as Athens says, this is this is the work that we have to do to, to build those things. You know, um, I've been involved in, in the web standards over the years for accessibility, and I've done a lot of research in this subject. And it, it really helps when you can, um, can give people the language to use to make them feel comfortable in approaching this topic and uh, make people feel, uh, you know, not that the work is easier because it's not easy and we're not going to say it's easier, but that it's more approachable to them and that they can perhaps understand it a little better and start with a small thing that goes towards the bigger picture. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, Harry, I noticed at the end of your presentation you had some resources. Are they just things that you've kind of just discovered over time? Is there any place at the moment where people can go to get kind of information if they're just starting out and they're you know brand new to the to the kind of world of accessibility? Um, yeah, what what are your thoughts there? Thanks. Um, yeah, mainly just come across things. Um, this conference, which has been, I mean, amazing for that. Even though yeah, the last few years there's been events, panel discussions, talks. Um, there's some stuff online that I know of. Um, the Juice Forum, obviously, for Juice-specific stuff is a great community. Um, but, I mean, this is just my take. I'm probably probably ignorant to a lot of things, but um, I wouldn't say there is a sort of uh, one sort of place where it's got it all kind of thing at the moment, as opposed to somewhere like, I mean, general accessibility, um, uh, in our team, we do, we do consult the WCAG guide, the guidelines. The G probably stands for guidelines. Um, and that's a very useful resource, but obviously that's quite general. Um, for sort of audio-specific, 
um, and like uh, audio app development accessibility. I guess there's not so much. Um, yeah, that's basically my take. Um, I'd love to hear more if there's, there's, there's other places to go to, but um, yeah. Jay, can I jump in on this quickly? Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> one of the things I, when you were saying about like, uh, when you're asking about resources, you know, the, the, the standards type approach is great, but because it's consensus driven, it tends to be quite slow, right? Um, and so that's one of the problems with that. And then, and then the special interest groups, again, great. I'm part of, you know, various ones. Um, but they tend to be quite transitory, like the, the useful information in them. Sure, you get knowledge bombs dropped on you like, you know, every every couple of meetings or so if you're in those meetups. But then if you're not, what happens to that information? Um, and so my take on this, for what it's worth, would be like some sort of like developer's blog, maybe, that like everybody could contribute to on a platform. Uh, I'm not trying to lump you with too much work, dude, but like maybe on Sound Without Sight. Um, it just kind of strikes me that, that that's a, you know, a, a sort of neutral ground, um, that like if you had a, if you had a sort of a development blog up there and just aimed for like, I don't know, one post per month, for example, uh, and they could be things like, you know, case studies, like maybe, um, maybe Harry would be up for, uh, sharing some of the resources that he put together in the presentation today. And then as those articles build up over time, uh, you've just got a bunch of tags and and then you've got like a one-stop place that you can go to that maybe isn't like the definitive resource of, of everything from, from the beginning, but it's like a, a growing collection of stuff that was useful to someone at some point when they were doing the work. Um, yeah, I'd be up for contributing. Sorry, we've got one radio mic at the moment, so we're just passing it down the line. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that's an awesome suggestion. And that was kind of one of the, the main points behind developing Sound Without Sight. I think the, the trick there is, is getting people involved who have the expertise, because um, I'm probably not the right person to be writing those articles, but you know, if we could get contributions from people like Harry and, and other people. Um, yeah, we're, yeah we're, I'm we're, imagining we're, contributions coming in from, like, from company, from developers at companies, et cetera, and stuff that's, you know, not giving away too much of anybody's sort of secret source, but stuff that they think other developers specifically in, in accessibility spaces will find useful. Yeah, yeah, and I think Focusrite used to have the development blog years ago, um, which was was really cool. Not specifically around accessibility stuff, but just that kind of thing. You know, this is some work we're doing that we think is cool. Have it, um, and it'd be awesome to see some more stuff like that to make the industry, um, the the commercial side of the industry, a little bit more open source. Um, I'd love to see that. Um, Adil, you had your hand up a second ago. Uh, hi, just taking a pass at the same question, um, coming from a slightly different angle. So that's cool from an implementation standpoint. Um, maybe a response more targeted to producty people. Do we have any producty people in the room, by the way? Product designers, product managers. Okay, I'm going to talk to myself. I love, I love doing that. So um, there are loads of communities. Um, oh well, there are communities that exist. Uh, people who are kind of bound together with um, shared interests, uh, shared experiences and whatnot. And uh, amongst other things, you know, amongst providing a great haven and great hang, um, these are immense wealths of information. Um, complete control access run by Chris Ankin. Shout out if you're on the call. Um, you know, that, that's a group that we lean into very heavily. We, we read every post and there's a huge amount that we can learn about how customers are using the products where customers are struggling, where customers need to ask more questions to gain more information. So if you're a designer or you're a product person and you're trying to figure out what to do next, um, that's a kind of great source of inspiration and insight. Just read those posts, read forums, um, get on there and, you know, just 
look at what users are talking about, what users are complaining about, what users are curious about, confused about. And that's really, that's a starting point. Of course, it doesn't help you with how you go about doing that, especially if your questions are technical. Um, there are smarter people than me to uh, advise on that kind of thing. Uh, but that, that, that's one half of the answer. Um, the other half, uh, particularly if you're a product manager um, and if you're kind of involved with investments or anything like that within your company, um, hire people, hire consultants, uh, hire experts, hire, hire Andre Louis, hire um, Scott. They're really, really experienced. They've done this 100 times over for tons and tons of different products. Um, I mean, Scott in particular has this innate ability to articulate user-facing problems in a very kind of astute way uh, without shouting at me too much. Yeah, you don't always have to pay me either. I mean, I'd like it if you do, but you know, I shout at Adil all the time and he doesn't pay me. So, yeah, there you go. Some, some freebies. I mean, it's, uh, you know, there are experts out there who are also very nice people who are able and willing to provide a service and, you know, they're able to lend their expertise. So... Let's make the most of it. It's win, win, win. The other thing that's worth tagging on to this, I think, is that most screen reader users know other screen reader users, right? And so really what you've got to do is find one that you can talk to <laughs> and then just ask them for what you need. And, you know, if you know if, if all you need is like, hey, cool, so you're telling me loads about Windows. Do you know some people that use Mac as well? They'll know someone. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I guess to just uh, add one little thing there, again, from the product design point of view, um, <clears throat> there's there's no real, like, standard when it comes to product design. You know, every app is a bit different. Um, and I think I agree with Adi about, you know, the idea of there being a standard from a product point of view seems <clears throat> probably like it could be a bit of a problem, pretty hard to develop quickly. But, you know, what's really important is I've like, I mean, even today, I've 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 seen a couple of things, a couple of tricks that I'm I'm going to contact the Audacity guys who are right now building accessibility into Audacity, or rather, the new version of Audacity with our new interface and everything. Um, and kind of go, oh, I saw something really cool. You should actually switch that around and do this instead. So it's really, I think, a resource of best practices is, you know, what would be great. I, I like the idea of a blog. I would also because. Uh, I'm a big YouTube junkie. I would also, you know, pepper it with nice YouTube videos. And if it's well organized, you kind of go like, here's the kind of, let's say, the disability in question. Here's best practices, or here's some good examples of how someone approached this problem. Here's the specific uh, issue they were trying to solve. Um, and that's always really good because it's that context that really helps. Because if you're developing, you know, just to give one example, I, I, I even found a music score on the train over here that we actually failed in one particular area. There's this tendency to make a mistake when it comes to like trying to design uh, keyboard tab navigation for, for, for blind users to, when you have a horizontal menu, have left and right go between the buttons. When you've got a vertical menu, have up and down. But like to a blind person, it could be a vertical list mental model they have or a horizontal list or nothing at all. Uh, it's ping, you drill down to another thing, you drill down to another thing, and they they don't know whether something is right or left or up or down. And those kind of problems happen all the time. And it's often that in, that first bit of just kind of comprehending the the problem and then watching how someone else has done it in the past really, really can can leap you forward to not make all these kinds of mistakes. Because it's it's rather embarrassing when you put it, you know, an app in front of uh, someone with a disability and they demonstrate to you that you really didn't think something through, you know? So I, I often think that, yeah, well, anyway, I'm kind of just saying what other people said here, but... Just to, just to throw another example into the ring that I've, that's something I think about quite a bit, just specific to, to audio, is um, something like metering, where you want to present the level of something as it's happening. And the reason why, you know, we have a level meter, visual level meter, and it kind of works is because you can you can process in parallel two senses. It's like you can hear the thing happening, you can see what's happening, or oh, it's a bit close to clipping, I better turn it down. But how do you present that information um, to someone who cannot see? There's 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 a few ways, right? You can have them poll and it read out. There's um yeah, quite a few other ways. And I'm really interested in learning those sorts of things. And I think it's things like that. There's not loads that are specific to um, music and audio, 
that is quite, um, yeah, just quite interesting. Um, hey, Harry, if you want to talk yeah. about metering, uh, yeah. send me an email. I've been battling this for about five years in sure. Asara. <laughs> sure, that would be great. Uh, and I haven't yeah. won the battle yet, but I've definitely I've tried out a bunch of different stuff and yep. I've got quite a lot of like user observation of of each of those approaches so um yeah yeah great a really a really really quick summary is that like basically the the dual sense kind of approach that you're talking about um it doesn't work for screen reader users because you're you're listening to audio and you're listening to the friendly robot chat about you know how loud the audio is um and so with a screen reader the the best way i've found to approach it here is just to kind of treat metering as like a threshold um <clears throat> so the user can poll on demand uh if if they want to um but also have it so that they can specify some sort of target right so if it's a peak meter let's say they want to be told when they reach minus 10 or over for example and then the whole time they're below that it's not chatting away they're just hearing their audio and then they just raise up the gain slowly and boink they get some sort of alert whether it's like a, a noise or a, a, a number that's spoken um and i mean that approach is as simplistic as it is uh, in that it leaves a whole bunch of of um the range of that meter like unspoken remember the user can still poll for that if they want it when they're in that space really what it does is it alerts you to the stuff that you've said you do want to know about um and it works really well across like peak meters uh, like luffs uh game reduction works really well for for a whole bunch of situations nice um adi i see you've got your hand raised yeah thank you um I just wanted to uh, add to what Scott said about blogging, but in a way of those of us who work on products, whether we're developers, product managers, whoever we might be, when we're learning about accessibility, we have to think about how we don't just learn and move on and how we actually pass that information through our teams and through the rest of the business because it's our responsibility in in a way to uh, take that knowledge and make sure that internally we don't repeat the same mistakes. It's not avoidable, unfortunately. Uh, time has proven that. But I think that that needs to be some of the change in attitude to see a, quite a major change across the industry is to have... Uh, this stuff not just fall to that one developer who worked for you for a couple of years and then as soon as they move on that's you know you have to start again I think a lot of the documentation and what what's dubbed inner source by some of the git companies or the the version control companies the the inner source of what you do the sharing of that knowledge making sure that people across teams can always access that or learn if they want to learn um, and then contribute to the efforts um, is really, really important. And I think that's something I'm really trying to instill here. Um, but yeah, I, I would speak to anybody who's looking to get into accessibility on their teams to always think about how they're passing that information on as well and uh, create that space for your company to learn too. It's a funny one because I, I think there's not really anyone who would kind of go out there and say I'm not into accessibility I don't want a more inclusive industry and like it's just working out practically how we can document this stuff um, obviously it's great when products are accessible and people need a wide range of products that all need to work together to create good music or good audio right and I guess that's just to wrap up this point that that's the point <laughs> it'd be great to document the great work that's happening um, we're running out of time very fast so I wanted to go to some audience Q&A um, do we have a volunteer in the room with a radio mic anywhere? Um, and do we have some hands up to receive a mic? Here you go. Oh. Thanks. First of all, thanks a lot for the talk. That was really inspiring. Uh, we were discussing earlier a bit about maybe the language barrier. And when we were talking, uh, when you were showcasing like uh, voiceover, I was thinking, uh, does it uh, kind of integrate well? So I, I've not, I've, 
I have not been using Juice for the past year, so I don't know how it's the current state for it, but I remember there was this feature that allows uh, easily, kind of easily to change the language of it. So how well does it integrate with it to maybe try to as well lower the maybe the language barrier to maybe users that are not English speakers or so on? Cool, so it's probably one for Tom and maybe Scott. You've talked about language stuff before. Uh, I, I can't sort of speak with any authority on how like the screen reader technologies uh, digest different languages. Um, but I can say, I, I nearly put in my update, but I thought it might be a bit too cheeky, is that um, in Juice 8, again, which is coming up, uh, one of the main features is just much, much better language support. So that's like at least adjacent to the accessibility that we we're talking now. Um, so currently, we can't render every single character available, uh, and that will change. Um, but as I said, um, I, I don't have any feel for how screen readers and operating systems can, can deal with that. Oh. Yes. Oh, sorry. Go on, Scott. Um, so uh, most, mo if, uh, most, if not all, I, in fact, I think all screen readers at this point are translated into a bunch of different languages. In general, if the operating system is available in a language, then then the, the screen reader will generally match that. It's not true in every case of ev in every third party screen reader, but they try to keep it like a decent parity between those two things. Um, so that means that the uh, the the types of controls like button, combo box, radio button, list box, slider, whatever. Like when my buddy over in Portugal uses his screen reader over there in his Windows that's in Portuguese and he's in Reaper with his Portuguese Lang pack and his Asara is in Portuguese, his screen reader is also in Portuguese, right? And so instead of combo box, it'll say whatever that is in Portuguese. <laughs> um, so, you know... There is, I, I think, relatively decent coverage if you want um, the language in a different language. What is less well catered for is making that language uh, less technical and less intimidating. The nearest thing there is to that is um, pretty much all screen readers have like verbosity settings. And so you can tell the screen reader locally whether you want it to tell you what a control is like or how to interact with it and so that can go all the way from like literally just telling you a text label right up to telling you the text label the control type uh, what keys you can use to interact with it and and that kind of stuff uh, but that's not something you have to worry about as a as an application developer that's all like local stuff baked into each screen reader that each user will take charge of for themselves to, to set things the way that they want it that's productive for them uh, yeah i just want to say quickly from a technical point of view um uh for in focus right control 2 for our fourth gens we do have localization support for i think 12 languages and in terms of and that includes the titles and stuff for for screen reader you can just treat it as any other translatable string um so we've just got a bunch of strings that get um and text that gets translated whenever we translate the app um so then the rest is just handled by the, the os i guess and the, the screen readers language support there um so yeah it's pretty pretty straightforward in juice and sounds like it will be even more straightforward soon cool so we'll take another question in person then we'll go to the online questions Yeah, thanks a lot for the great panel and a great uh, showcase. Uh, there was a lot going on about uh, mainly desktop-based access with a keyboard, right? And I was just curious because I'm personally a mobile audio application developer. And uh, could you either summarize the advice for the mobile apps here? Or could you then maybe point to resources that deal with the topic of music-focused mobile apps and accessibility. Cool, yeah, who wants to take that? I have some <laughs> things to say. <laughs> um, all right, I'm going to pick someone. Um, I I'm thinking in terms of Note, AD, can you contribute anything on that? Or Harry, in terms of Focusrite's mobile apps, or are they not your, not your bag? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Harry, are you happy for me to go? 
Perfect. Um, in terms of uh, like the documentation for the accessibility of mobile applications, if you're working in iOS, which we are, are exclusively, in, unfortunately, for Note at the moment, um, and that's because of the digital processing for audio isn't quite up. It, we can't do what we can do on iOS with Android at the moment. So, um, but yeah, the, there's a lot of documentation about um, mobile accessibility, and there's a lot of things built into um, Swift, um, Swift UI components that are already inherently accessible. And so, if you're using a lot of the standard components, the accessibility is there already in VoiceOver. Um, you just have to make sure that you know how things are being labeled and if something needs this kind of a, a, a tip or a help a help hint or something that you are putting that in um, so that people can access other information about that. The biggest challenge for music-based mobile apps though I found is, is uh, what we call direct touch areas. So direct touch areas are areas of an application, like a grid, like a set of keys that you want to interact with without voiceover giving feedback, because that's where the sound is triggered from. And so if you don't have direct touch enabled, then voiceover is trying to read a lot of what um, is represented on the screen. And if you do have direct in touch enabled, then you don't hear any voiceover feedback for that area, but you can easily get trapped in a direct touch area if you don't know where it's located on the screen, if it takes up a lot of the screen real estate and the smaller things around the outside don't. So this has been one of the biggest challenges I think about, for, for us at least, about uh, representing those areas well and knowing when to use them and when not to use them. And uh, because we had a lot of system controls in the beginning, we actually had a lot more of these areas than we should have had. And we went back and, uh, you know, retroactively changed these to standard components, which made uh, the accessibility Im improve vastly across the app. Um, but we're still, I don't think we've we've nailed it yet, but we're still working on that. And there isn't really that much documentation, but I would say fall back on the, the mobile um, app development languages that they have their um, kind of resources about accessibility and mobile accessibility um, where you can and use standard components as much as possible. Cool. Um, I haven't had that much experience with mobile app development, but just to point, um, point you to a colleague of mine, Kane McCormack, did a talk on how we made Launchpad iOS accessible. I think that was at ADC 2021. Um, yeah, that would be on YouTube. Um, that, I think that was built using Swift. Um, so yeah, check that out. That's a really also good talk. Worth, also just worth tagging on to the end of this in case you didn't know, VoiceOver is on every... Uh, iDevice at the moment, every iPhone, every iPad. Uh, so settings, accessibility, turn on voiceover in there. It explains the gestures and that kind of stuff right at the top of the of the voiceover screen. So just open up your app and have a poke around. Cool. So I'm hoping we've got my colleague Daisy on the line who has been monitoring some of the online questions. Um, so either from the Zoom Q&A or from the email, Daisy, have you got any particular questions that stand out? Um, we've got a couple in the Zoom. So a few have been for um, basically for reference materials, asking particularly about accessibility uh, programming in Juice, where the ref reference materials are. Um, we've got one asking, is the audio modelling accessibility project open for public participants? Um, and a question for... Adil, are the new NKS accessibility features coming to the Machina MK3 hardware? I'm even more of an imposter than the other imposters who've announced themselves, so I hope I've pronounced everything correctly, but there you go. Cool. So audio modeling-wise, I think probably the most direct route into that would be through the MIDI um, Special Interest Group for Accessibility. Um, so audio modeling play quite a big part in there. Um, and yeah, Adil. Hi, thank you for the question. Uh, they are not, unfortunately. So just to reiterate, we I, I mentioned earlier, we've had a big overhaul of NKS. Um, 
especially for the Control Mark III keyboard, which you can come and check out by our booth. It should be set up now. Uh, the question was, will those, function, will those new capabilities be available to the Machina Mark III? And I, I guess more generally speaking, any of the uh, in-market hardware um, that we've already released. So the Mark III generation of Machinas, the Mark II generation of keyboard controllers. Um, unfortunately, they're not. Uh, part of the reason for this is that these NKS2... These, these NKS capability enhancements are predicated on the new technology stack. Um, so we rely on clevers that are happening under the hood. Um, it means they're only really possible for devices built from this point onwards. Um, think the bigger screen, think the high resolution data uh, transfer, and so on. Sorry. Cool. Any more online, Daisy? Uh, oh, one has just come in. Um... So Zach says, really great talk. I was the person who uploaded a note to Apple Viz. Do we have a timeline for live accessibility? Really excited to give it a shot. Cool. So that's one for you, AD. Uh, yes. Uh, as I said, the public beta is going um, out very soon. So please uh, head to ableton.com for checking in on that. And uh, if you'd like to email me, I can be a little uh, more open about that in a private discussion. I'm watching this stage, I can't be. Um, but uh, yes, uh, I would love to talk to you more about this. And Zach, thank you for the, for the review. I'm really, really thankful, really, really grateful, and really, really glad that you're enjoying the app. Cool. And what's the email address for Ableton Accessibility stuff? Accessibility at Ableton.com. Beautiful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. What about in the room? Have we got any more hands up? Um, one here. Hi. Uh, lovely talk. It's like uh, really enlightening. Um, uh, as a fellow imposter, I come from a non-development background, so pardon me for phrasing my question. I'll try to make it as clear as possible. Uh, my first question is to uh, Mr. Scott, uh, if you're still on the call. Um, yeah, uh, I've noticed you have uh, experience in uh, development accessibility for Reaper, and uh, as a Reaper user, I'm like, uh, I'm very like, uh, it's mind-boggling the amount of uh, flexibility and customizability of the software. It's like a make-your-own-do kind of thing. So it's it's very, it's very amazing. But at the same time, uh, it can be quite daunting, especially for a first-time user. Uh, is there a <laughs> Is there a plan like for like let's say an onboarding experience where you can uh, be guided by some sort of wizard that can uh, guide you from like how would you like since there are a lot of customization uh, capabilities for the software how would you like the software to work for you as a guided wizard since that preferences menu can be a bit challenging and uh, this leads me to the second question for like any one of the panel might might be able to join is that uh, how do you tackle the issue of testing when it comes to accessibility? Like, uh, do you cross test with uh, multiple focus groups? Like, let's say, uh, first time users with uh, people with, like, let's say, uh, visual impairment, or do you like um, assign specific group that is specific for, uh, let's say, visual impairment and first time users separately? So. Yeah, sorry for the long question. <laughs> That's cool. Uh, so I'll just go quick on the Reaper thing because I know we're running out of time. But um, so what? Basically, what we try to do accessibility-wise is um, we we as much as possible we we rely on the Reaper API, and so it doesn't require a ton of specific setup things being configured. You know, X, Y, and Z. They have to be a certain way for the accessibility to to work at its best. Um, we do that partly just for robustness, partly to to kind of make the onboarding experience as easy as possible, and also so that so that screen reader users can work alongside sighted folks, and the screen reader user doesn't have to have the DAW set up in like some weird and wonderful ways. Um, there are a couple of settings that make a big difference, but uh, so right now what we do is we document the hell out of that, um, uh, and that's like written documentation. And there's also a bunch of like audio getting started guides that I'm that I'm always updating. Um, uh, eventually, what we would like to do is have like a couple of questions for those 
those key kind of settings built into the Asara installer. So built into the, the accessibility extensions installer. Um, when that will happen, I don't know. But at some point, I'm going to get someone cleverer than me to have a shot at it. <laughs> Cool. Thank you so much. I think Adil just had something to add on that second question. Yep. Um, just in terms of how we test. So how we do things at Native, uh, I guess there are three phases, really. There's the kind of development phase, there's the alpha phase, and there's the beta phase. Um, and all of that leads up to the public release. Um, so when something's being built, um, essentially everyone's involved. So the product managers, product designers, developers, QAs, you name it. Um, it's really important that everyone really understands the problem that we're trying to solve and it's really important that we're able to put ourselves in user, user shoes so there's kind of there's no point in testing screen reader functionality without a screen reader there's no point in testing hardware accessibility without actually putting it into its accessibility mode so um most recent example for me was the machina um Mark III accessibility release that earlier this year coupled with the ni accessibility helper and that really was a case of use the hardware blindfolded, you know, successfully get from beginning to end without looking at your screen. Um, with Machina, I think it was actually a case of put blindfold on and uh, physically navigate your way around the hardware. Um, it's a bit tricky because it's quite a complex device with a lot of buttons and it's something that I've been looking at for a very long time. I've got a lot of prior experience there, so it's not easy for me to convince myself I'm a new user. Um, it's not easy to convince myself that I don't remember where these buttons are. It's just something to be mindful of. Uh, yeah, with things like keyboards, you know, I've made paper cutouts before that I overlay onto the screen so that I can have access to the buttons but not have access to the screen. I think getting everybody thinking about this. Um, the other thing that somebody said, I think it was Scott said earlier, is uh, if your product sits in this part of the user journey and that's accessible, great but what about everything else? What about everything that happens before you reach your product? What about everything that happens after? So if you've built the most accessible solution in the world, but customers can't download it, that's a problem. If you've built the most accessible experience in the world, but customers can't then get in touch with your support department, that's a problem. So these are things to just be mindful of, you know, map that user journey out, make sure you know what your place is in that user journey and uh, what the kind of handoff points are and if there's anything else that you can do either side and be testing that. The question was about testing, so I'll come back to that. Uh, we've got, generally speaking, during the, the development phase, we've got our kind of trusted cohort of alpha testers who are those that, you know, we share slightly more sensitive information with. They're privy to um, decision-making details. They're, um, they're the sort of people who can influence the direction of the product, either kind of high-level or micro-UX decisions. Um, and once we've stabilised, once we've got what we'd call an MVP, you know, something that's viable, something that we think, okay... This, um, this this might be it, you know, this is something that we might be able to go to market with. That's when it will enter a beta phase. At that point, product direction is slightly more hardened. Um, you know, we're not going to fundamentally revisit the concept. We're probably not going to pull the release. We're probably not going to say this isn't good enough. But while, rather, we are leveraging and entrusting a larger pool of... Of, uh, of customers and users to help us with things like catching out bugs and identifying kinks in workflows. It's that thing of hey, um, you've built this accessible workflow, but did you think about changing the audio uh, device halfway through the workflow? Because you can do it at the beginning, but can you do it towards the end? No, you didn't think about it. And now customers need to turn software that's not screen readable. Oh dear, I've hit a roadblock. So what can we do about that? Um, so yeah, just working in those three phases and kind of widening the pool at every, every step of the way is something that helps. Yeah, that's how we do it. Okay. Yeah, please. Uh, we had a bit of a different approach when de developing the screen reader integration for console one, which was our first and so far only really accessible hardware and software. Um, <clears throat> we basically made our own first best guess of... We, we just want to make everything accessible, everything that you can do on the hardware should be read, read out. Uh, and then we gave it to to testers. We had we worked mainly with Jason uh, Descent, who's an accessibility. Uh, oh, what is it that he calls himself? Uh, uh, accessibility consultant, uh, uh, and he's a he's a blind music producer. Uh, and then he got to to try it out to basically find our 
our blind spots, what we hadn't thought about. And then basically through him just uh, getting it in the hands of as, as many visually impaired users as possible and not giving them any like feedback. Test this, test this, test this. Just blindly going into it. We want their... Uh, their first experience. What do they like? What don't they like? What have we we missed? What what can they do? What can't they do? Basically, just give give it to your users and let them evaluate it for you. For I totally agree with someone uh, said. Uh, basically something along the lines that let your users be the designers because they know how to how the software is actually supposed to be used in this case in, in case you aren't <coughs> yourself uh, visually impa impaired in in our case then but yeah Amazing. Well, I think looking at the time, we're probably going to have to wrap up there. There's a million things that I would love to include in the session. Um, I have more questions myself, and I'm sure we have more online and in the room. Um, but yeah, I'd love to continue the conversation. I know there is a there's a kind of persistent Discord um, channel um, across ADC um, to continue the conversation. And feel free to email any questions to contact contact at soundwithoutsight.org. .org. Um, I'll do my best to badger the panel. Um, beyond the confines of this session um, to get those answered. Um, but yeah, I guess the only thing left to say is thank you to ADC to, for kind of creating the space for this to happen. Um, and thank, thank you to all the panel. You've been amazing. Um, and our online panelists as well. Um, yeah, thank you, everyone.